Hey everyone, welcome to the third Naira Metrics Economic Outlook for the year. Um, with the team projecting Nigeria's economy, economic recovery. My name is Wade Ahimie, and I'm a member of the Naira Metrics Editorial Board. Um, we'll be looking at what shape our recovery will be looking like. Um, would it be L-shaped? Would it be U-shaped? Meaning that we're currently hit a bottom and we're right above bottom and we'll gradually start moving up in the right direction. Will it be V? We'll hit the bottom and we'll just continue moving in the right direction in the months to come. Will it be L? Meaning that we've hit bottom and we're going to stay there for a, for a, bit, for a bit of time. Or will it be W? We're going up and down and back up again. Um, just a few highlights that we'll take before um, we get into the panel sessions. Um, I'll just give you a brief from last session, which where two things became very, very um, prominent from what um, Dr. Ola said. Um, the virus doesn't move except people move, and except people move, ideas will not generate the economic increase, and which for us is true. And that's why we're having this session again today. And um, we found out that as more people moved around the world, the virus moved along with it. But it, it brought about new ideas. Today we're on Zoom. Usually would on a wet day like this on Saturday, we'll probably all be struggling to get where we should be attending this session. So thank you, Zoom, and thank you for all, all our panelists who are going to share their experiences with us. A quick, um, a brief outlook at the things that have happened in quarter two, um, especially as it relates to the economy in Nigeria. Fortunately, a lot of the economists and analysts were looking at the GDP, GDP, GDP to fall by double digits. But fortunately, Nigeria GDP just went down by about 6.1%. And when you compare us to the UK that had double digits um, GDP contraction, um, capital inflows have dropped by about 78% in comparison to quarter one. Um, some of the main contributors to this drop are the oil and gas sector, um, the non-oil sector, accommodation and food, especially when you consider the fact that the virus hits a lot of um, 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 businesses relating to um, entertainment and um, um, food and accommodation services. Um, real estate too has gone down because of the fact that you needed to um, social distance and more and less people were, were willing to put so many people on, on the platform towards ensuring that buildings were put in place. Education has hit a big, has, has gone, gone down a lot by about 20.09% um, because the new normal of having to do um, um, lessons through Zoom have become difficult where parents have to struggle between work and actually guiding their kids towards ensuring that they get a good education. Um, without much ado, I would like to go on and introduce my friend who will be mentor, who will be the host for this panel session. My good friend, my and the co-founder and the founder, sorry, of Naira Metrics, my friend for so many years, Ugo Dre. Ugo, the ball is in your court. Thank you very thank, much and listening. Thank, all right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Wade. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction. Uh, welcome everybody, wherever you're zooming in from, whether you're in Nigeria, you're in the US, you're in Canada, you're in UK, you're in South Africa, all over the world. Thank you so much for being a part of this Economic Outlook, our third installment. And this is our second installment via Zoom. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, today, we're gonna be having amazing panelists on this uh, uh, webinar. And we're going to be discussing something that is very, very dear to my heart. And I'm sure it's dear to everybody's heart as well. This is a very critical period for us in Nigeria. Uh, whether you're Nigerians or whether you're an investor in Nigeria, this is a, uh, a tipping point for us. And it is important that we all come together to discuss um, what the current GDP numbers mean for us and how quickly we can get out of this mess that we find ourselves in. Uh, some of us have said that we're probably going to be in a recession or we're probably in a recession already. Uh, it's just that we're waiting for the numbers to come out. So let's, let's just accept that that's what it is. But how do we get out of the recession? What does government need to do to get us out of the recession? What does the private sector need to do to get out of the recession? And then what should you be doing as a business owner, employee, or as an entrepreneur to navigate through these difficult waters that we find ourselves in? That is what we're going to be discussing today. And I have amazing panelists uh, on, on this webinar. And I'm going to be just uh, going to be calling out your names. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Andrew Nevin. I'm sure you know his household name already. Andrew is a partner, FS leader, and chief economist at PWC 
West Africa. He's also the founding director of the Africa Institute for Leadership and Public Administration. Andrew's CV is right there. You can say no need to go too far. Amazing panelists he's an economist. He's going to be giving us amazing insights. So uh, we're going to go to the next panelist. We have Mayoga uh, by Bash Bashirat Odineo Bashirat is the Group Executive Energy and Infrastructure of First Bank Nigeria. She also has a master's degree in technology and development from Imperial College. Uh, she's going to be coming with insights from the oil and gas and energy um, sector. We also have as well on this panel, straight up from Corona, Coronation Merchant Bank, Guy, I think I got the name right this time, Chatoski. I hope I got it right, Guy. Right, Guy uh, is a group executive, energy and infrastructure. Sorry, Guy is the head of research at Coronation Merchant Bank, former head of investment strategy uh, in FCMB UK. Guy is also going to be joining on as one of the panelists. And we move to the next panelist. We have as well Rulake Akinkuge Filani. Rulake is the chief commercial officer at Mixta Africa. Uh, she's, also managing direct, she's also the managing director of Energy Inc. Advisors. Rulake is uh, an MBA at Triumph Global Executive, MSc International Relations from London School of Economics and Political Science, BSc Government from London, BS, BSc Government from London School of Economics and Political Science. Rulake, if you know her very well, she's a household name in economic policy in Nigeria. She speaks very well when it comes to energy, real estate, versatile in the economy as well. And it's amazing to have her on this panel. We're gonna be hearing insights from her uh, as well. And then last, but definitely not the least, last but not the least, we have Fola Fagwile as well. Uh, Fola is the senior vice president uh, at African Finance Corporation, AFC. Uh, he has an MBA in business administration at the Lagos Business School. Fola is gonna be coming with insights from uh, how we can get concessionary funding. How does the international um, lending community assist Nigeria in getting out of these trouble waters that we find ourselves in? So that is my super panel today. And we're going to be discussing Nigeria's economic recovery. How do we get out of it? Is it going to be a U-shaped, L-shaped, W-shaped, or V-shaped? So uh, I'm going to hand over straight away to Andrew. Uh, I think Andrew is going to be uh, um, presenting... Uh, a 10 minutes outlook for Nigeria. So please listen keenly as Andu takes over. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ugo, and just uh, thank you everyone for joining this morning. And really, I just echo Ugo's words, an incredible panel. First, I mean, Naira Metrics plays such a critical role in, uh, in Nigeria um, in so many ways. But I mean, when we've got uh, Basharat and, and Guy and Rolaki and Fola, AFC, Mixed to Africa, Coronation, FBN, all in the same uh, place with Naira metrics. Uh, something good is going to come out of it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, my role on this is just to kind of um, situate us a little bit. Let me just get my slides set up uh, with a, you know, a couple of facts and things to think about. Um, I'm curious to hear what all the panelists say. Are we heading to a W, a V, a K, an L, a straight I? I don't know. I mean, one of the things that's important for me is I don't make predictions, especially about the about the future. Um, but just to start out, I mean, these numbers by now are well known. I mean, it's incredible to think in March that there was so little understanding of what the economic impact would, would, would be. I remember one prominent economist, for example, who I won't name, and talking about the South African economy in March, late March, saying, well, the worst case is that uh, the economy flatlines. And of course, that's the worst case now is it declines by 15%. These are some of the, the numbers from, um, uh, I think from the IMF, in fact, of kind of where, where we're at um, on this. And you can see um, that uh, you know, globally we're expecting a 5% decline, 3% uh, in emerging markets, 3% in Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, these are massive numbers. I remember in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have um, uh, 3%, almost 3% population growth. So effectively, GDP per capita is shrinking by 6%, catastrophic numbers. And then the recovery, and these, these numbers have always been behind the curve. Um, these are, I think, a couple of months old. So the recovery would only take us back to the in raw GDP numbers where we were in 2019 in sub-Saharan Africa, which, which basically means, you know, 6 7% uh, decline in GDP per capita. So really, really very difficult times um, on that. And of course, you know, some of the other things that are going on that we see um, 
around around the patch is uh, collapse in uh, direct investment to global direct investment and globally we're talking about a 30 to 40 percent decline not a big surprise if you're going to make direct investment you've got to go visit a place you have to put the project together none of that is happening in in 2020 and of course remittances we we put out the paper last year that pointed out remittances were actually the only thing really holding up the economy expected to contract by uh you know over 20 percent in in sub-saharan africa so real economic pressures we've all seen in um in nigeria um uh, on that, and of course, this has all you know had an impact um, on uh, uh, co compounded by oil. Um, if you remember, people were very bullish in the first quarter. We sort of had sixty-five to seventy dollar oil. We looked like we might get to a little bit higher than GDP growth if we had a in twenty twenty, which would be the first year in five years or six years of um, not declining income per capita on that. But you know, compounding all of the issues in COVID-19, we've had the um, OPEC issues, collapse in oil price. I think we're relatively lucky that it's stabilized 40 to 45, but um, people should also be aware there's been a big decline in volume, right? So the volume's not 1.8 or 2.0, it's actually 1.4. So the squeeze on government revenues uh, is just actually, um, immense right now in, in, in Nigeria. And what's this all added up to? I mean, the question, are we in recession? I'm not, I mean, you're not even, I'm not even going there. I mean, I said back in March, it's just, we're not to be histrionic about it. We're not in a recession. We're in the worst economic downturn. I hope we'll ever, ever see. Uh, this chart puts it kind of in context. Um, we had a uh, 6.1% uh, headline number from the NBS, which reflects real GDP year over year. Um, and just to put this in context, you might have seen a spokesman for the president try to put a positive spin on this, and he had numbers like minus 33% in the US, minus 20% in the UK. The reality is these headline numbers are actually different animals that are going on. In the US case, for example, that's a 33% annualized uh, decline. Really, the GDP drop in the second quarter, quarter over quarter, if I remember right, is about 8%. And of course, we're growing 3% population-wise. So we both had a 9% collapse in GDP per capita. So there's no really good way to put a, a, a spin on this, to be honest. If we look at some of the sectors, um, you can see on the left-hand side, you know, just catastrophe in air transport and accommodation and food services. Um, real estate is particularly painful for me. We have been... Um, advocates we put out our big paper on dead capital and that's getting replayed around the nation we i hope the federal government is listening i know they're listening because the president's used the term on that but uh, real estate you know shrinking is just uh, a real issue um, and there's no recovery without real estate recovering and in fact i'll just say a mixed africa i love all my clients uh, but i particularly love mixed, mixed africa i was there at the creation of it uh, in Senegal a few years ago. And it's just very painful to see all the effort has gotten the mix to Africa's put in and yet the, you know, there's not an economic recovery that's, that's helping them move forward. Of course, this has also affected um, exchange rates. Uh, this just tracks the, the black lines, the most relevant. It tracks the difference between the parallel rate and the official rate. So in effect, we are moving to a closer and closer rate. I think it's inevitable. I mean, the CBN's ability to control the exchange market depends on having a supply of dollars. With the oil price decline and the volume decline, I mean, we all know there isn't that supply of dollars. So they've come out and said, we're moving to market exchange rates. Uh, I, I suspect that's going to be sooner, sooner rather than, than later. Um, I think one thing that is critically important in the economy right now is the collapse in interest rates. Um, there's a term for this uh, called financial repression, where the return that people get is below the inflation rate, in our case, substantially below the inflation rate. It's, a, it's an issue going forward. It particularly hurts the bottom of the pyramid because the, they don't have a lot of options for the way that they save and invest money. And if you're taking away 8% per year of someone's uh, um, uh, savings or, or you know, a small pool of savings, that's just, just prohibitive. So I'm not sure this, this situation can persist in the long run. We all understand the reason for it and a bit of the dynamic with the central bank and their OMO program for foreigners, but you can just see the magnitude of the collapse uh, in real interest rates in the economy. Um, some of the things that have been going on quickly is just, of course, the government, I think, has, has reacted probably as well as they can with uh, you know, different sorts of programs on that. But to put this in, 
in context the kind of stimulus we've seen in other countries, in developed countries, where they're able to kind of print their currency at will if you want, uh, quantitative easing in many forms, uh, is about 15 to 25 percent of GDP and still rising. Um, in the context of Nigeria, all of the programs together that were announced were maybe about 2 percent, 2.2 percent of GDP. So as a fiscal stimulus, much smaller. Also, I mean, these programs, we've come out and been critical of the government before. Too many programs, too much complexity, lack of implementation. We're not sure really whether um, we needed all of these announcements for programs that are not necessarily going to function, function well. What was most important and did happen to a large extent was getting uh, you know, food into the hands of the bottom of the pyramid and making sure that the food supply chain works. But some of these other things we don't think are going to, these short-term programs are necessarily going to going to work. Um, but some of the other things that the government has done, um, you can read here, I won't go through it all, but I think the general direction travel is very, very clear, which is the government is, federal government and all state governments are desperate to maximize revenue on that. And it's very difficult if we don't have a growing economy to, to increase uh, revenue. So we've had this conflict over the last few years as the government's trying to raise more revenue and the population is effectively pushed back on that. Um, now the need for revenue is, is, is greater. Uh, the fiscal uh, deficit is, is, is enormous uh, uh, that the states are going to start missing their payroll very, very soon. We've seen some uh, news stories come out, but it's really going to um, uh, accelerate on that. And simply, simply put, the federal government does not have enough money to support the hundreds and hundreds of MDAs, government-owned enterprises, that all sort of drain, drain the, drain the treasury. Uh, sorry, drain the treasury. Um, again, I will, I will say that uh, the, the one silver lining we see is the government has federal government in particular. I mean, the country has a huge amount of dead capital. The federal government has a huge amount of dead capital. For us, really unlocking that uh, dead capital is the key to, 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 to getting out of this and starting to grow in a, um, in a. Um, meaningful way. Um, just on the CBN side, here are some of the interventions again. Uh, again, really not um, uh, something that's going to pull us out of this. If we take the third one, for example, the number of groups, I mean, obviously, if you're a group that uh, sees the interest rate fall from 9% to 5% on the intervention fund, you're happy about that. But the real number of groups, the real total capital that that involves is, is quite small and creates distortions in the interest rate market and makes harder for the commercial lenders to participate in it. Um, so I think while it's a nice headline, it's not necessarily gonna, going to um, make a big, a big difference on that. Um, FDI is a real issue for us. As I said, globally, we're dropping 30 to 40%. For us, it may be closer to 100%. No one's coming to Nigeria. Airspace is not open. Even when it opens up, we're not going to see in 2020 anyone really come through uh, to Nigeria and make any investment. I mean, the earliest that we can see investment is perhaps the back half of 2021 on that. Um, as I said before, we've had on the crude side a collapse of both the volumes and the um, and the price. So you can see this is the net, or sort of the gross uh, dollar amount of the crude liftings in Nigeria. They drop by about 60%, which has all the obvious uh, flows, you know, flow through effects that we um, that we say. So I think by 10 minutes are coming to a close, um, and I'm really anxious to hear the, all the panelists, but I think it gives you a kind of a flavor of the difficult situation we're in. Um, I said I don't make predictions about, about the future. Uh, but what I will say at this point is I think that we are um, really, as Ugo said, I believe, that, uh, or Wade, that we are at a moment of truth in Nigeria. Uh, with the, we had um, growth below population for five years, increasing number of people in um, poverty. Um, and uh, sorry, just to sort of show some numbers on that. Here's a slide that shows from the World Bank the kind of uh, projection we're on in terms of the number of people continue to increase um, with the COVID-19 crisis. So during 2015 to 2019, we had uh, GDP per capita shrinking by one, little over 1% a year on average, obviously more in 2016. But, but the, the net result is that that put pressure on the system. But, but you can, I don't want to say cope, but it doesn't necessarily cause massive change. Now we've had a GDP per capita decline year over year of 10, almost 
we've had massive number of people uh, thrown into uh, unemployment. NBS finally put out a, a, an update on that that they hadn't put out for um, at least 18 months. So we all see the numbers of poverty. We all see the numbers of unemployment. We all see the numbers on the fiscal situation, on the FX pressure. And the question is, is that going to create uh, a catalyst for change, uh, a positive catalyst for change, or is it going to create a kind of disorderly restructuring? So we're really entering this kind of moment of, uh, of, of truth for the for the country. Um, how it turns out depends on really you know what the policymakers and the pre president in particular uh, does in this in this moment of truth. So I will pray that um, the country does the does the right thing. In a positive scenario, we become really the greatest economic story of the 21st century, which is eminently possible as everyone on this call knows. You might have seen eight weeks ago, the UN revised all of the population projections and said something that was absolutely extraordinary. Two things that were extraordinary. One was that the world population is gonna peak in their middle case in 2067, uh, much lower than was thought, which is great news for the planet and all the pressures that we understand from environmental damage and climate change. Uh, but they also said that Nigeria in the 21st century would become the second most populous country, which is amazing. Because of course, we've all stood up and said it's gonna become the third most populous. Uh, and now the UN is saying the second most populous. So, so it is imperative that we use this moment of truth in Nigeria to, to make this a positive trajectory, um, given, given the role that, you know, the path that Nigeria is on. And of course, as I said, when I open up, we have the, the, the people of the organizations in it that are going to make the most difference. So let me just stop there. Um, and as I said, I'm uh, anxiously awaiting to see who's projecting W, who's projecting K, who's projecting L. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, moment of truth. I like the way this is captured already. It looks like we have a, a catch line uh, already for this uh, webinar. Um, just in case you, uh, maybe you have a friend who uh, is trying to log in and can't log in because it appears we, we probably have maxed out. Uh, this webinar is also being streamed on YouTube um, as well. So go to Nyometrics uh, YouTube uh, account and then you can also watch uh, from there as well. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that uh, we have maxed out on uh, on on uh, on Zoom. Uh, I, I'm just going to be going through some of the things that that uh, I noted from from Andrew's presentation. Uh, worst case is that uh, at some point he said worst case is that the decline is by 15 percent. We did do by minus six percent. Uh, remittances uh, might contract by 20 percent. I think for Sub-Saharan Africa, that is indeed uh, drastic. Uh, because a lot of Nigerians, especially um, you know, those of us who are families abroad, rely heavily on remittances just to get by. And if we're going to see remittances cut by as much as 20%, then that is uh, a huge problem. I, you know, Andrew also said there's a squeeze in government revenue as well. Catastrophic, and that's the word term he used. Um, government is struggling, and that is why I guess we're seeing subsidy removals across board. Uh, this is likely not even a recession. Andrew said he's not in the, in the business of predicting uh, a recession, but uh, he did say this is looking like the worst economic downturn that we have seen or we, we've, we've seen in recent times. And we just hope that we can get out of it as quickly as possible. Um, Andrew also mentioned a collapse in interest rate. That, that kind of caught my attention as well. And when you have a collapse in interest rate, that's a problem because uh, at inflation rate at 12.8%, and then you have interest rates, uh, well, when I say interest rates, savings deposit rates, or even um, um, uh, fixed income rates uh, drop below inflation, then uh, that is negative real return for a lot of Nigerians, and of course, indeed, investors. Uh, and then Andrew also said that uh, for stimulus, you know, a lot of countries have done between 15 to 25% of GDP as stimulus, uh, but Nigeria is just at 2% of GDP, so we're nowhere close to the kind of stimulus that you need to get us out of recovery. Um, and these are all rich countries, bigger countries. They've done 15 to 25%. And we have actually been having tepid good for some time now, but we're still at 2% of GDP in terms of stimulus that the government has injected. And Andrew also says states, states are, are likely gonna be having major payroll related issues. They might miss payroll. This is one of the reasons why the World Bank loan is very, very important for us to secure. Uh, because states are hoping that we can get uh, between $1 to $1.5 billion in, in World Bank funding. And this is in addition to the $1.5 billion the federal government is also asking for. Um, and then 
Crude oil lifting dropped by 64%. Uh, I think Basharat is here. She's also going to chime in, I believe, on this, uh, on this uh, aspect as well. And then there's something else that, 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 he did, that Andrew did say. Uh, he mentioned that this was uh, a silver lining. Uh, and that is the debt, the amount of debt capital that we have in Nigeria, humongous. And when you say debt capital, we're talking about capital that is locked in assets that we cannot monetize. So think, think of real estate, think of uh, you know, roads, think of rail lines, things that are just out there that we can monetize. And government owns a lot of all these assets, private sector assets as well. I'm sure Rolake is also going to chime in into um, uh, this, this talking point. Um, so I'm going to go right into the panelists. And I know Andrew says he doesn't like to predict, but I'm going to put him on the spot here. Uh, of course, feel free to plead the fifth, but uh, I'll put you on the spot, Andrew. Um, so what kind of recovery uh, would you... Okay, so let me spin it in a way that wouldn't be like a prediction. What kind of recovery would you prefer? Uh, do you think U-shaped, uh, V-shaped, W-shaped, L-shaped? What kind of recovery? And then... Um, do, why do you think that's the recovery that you think Nigeria needs at the moment? And be realistic as well. Uh, th thank you for that. I, I mean, I guess I'm, I, to be honest, I mean, I, people accuse me on Twitter sometimes of so much bad news. I'm actually in the kind of optimistic camp. I think we've reached the point, first off, you know, um, because of our efforts and other people's efforts, I think some of the structural things around the economy are very well understood. The role of remittances, you know, how small the uh, oil, oil sector is actually contributing. Um, and also, critically, this dead capital. So I, I think that that sort of thinking is, is, is seeped through um, around the country. I think we've also talked a lot, as others have started to as well, about states taking the responsibility for their own economic destiny. And I think all of these things are, and then the forced, you know, the nature of the COVID disaster, economic health and the economic disaster is forcing this moment of truth. And I think there'll be enough pressure on the system that we're gonna get a positive outcome. I mean, so then what, you know, what drives recovery in a GDP sense? Um, I mean, we'd be very clear that you need to have a greater level of investment and we get only about 60% of the investment we need to get. What we want is at least six to 8% growth. The CBN governor once said double digit. I'd like to hold him to that, please, uh, on that. So we need about at least um, almost double, if not more than double the level of investment. But if we get this positive, signs going that we're moving, we're unlocking the dead capital, the capital is there, it's really gonna encourage this. And you know, I think we can reach it. So I'm in the optimistic camp. I'm not, I'm not sure, to be honest, what the alternative is. If the country does not take advantage of this moment of truth, um, and so I'm not to be kind of alarmist on that, but we've seen events in Mali, pressure building in Burkina Faso, the region is very volatile. How long can Nigeria go having declining income per capita and then in 2020, a 10% decline in income per capita before we have some terrible outcomes. So the country needs to take advantage of this moment of truth to get on the right trajectory. So that's my prediction. So that, I'll call that my prediction. So I'll, I'll give that a U-shaped recovery then. <laughs> Rocket-shaped U. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna move next to Bashirat. Uh, Bashirat, I mean, you've had Andrew's presentation and you've seen uh, you know, he's basically painted the picture of what our reality is at the moment. So for you, um, and hearing everything that he said, what kind of recovery do you think Nigeria should be yearning for and realistically can get and, and why? Okay, um, thanks uh, very much, Ugo. And Andrew, that was a great presentation. Um, I think I'm going to answer like a typical economist. I'm not an economist, but at the same time, you know, looking at where we're coming from, we all know that at the beginning of the pandemic, all prices were trending towards the 70s. And I mean, it was like just one of the best ever for a lot of uh, years past. Of course, due to the pandemic, it went as low as 15. And in recent times, in the last two weeks, and even the last month, it's been hovering about 44, 45. You know, but as we know, for Nigeria in particular, 90% of our revenues is dependent on what we have in terms of oil revenues. And um, unfortunately, it's a global product. So no matter what we do, we have to be able to get it as a good level of demand. And if I bring in what is going on, um, you know, Nigeria didn't quite comply with the OPEC uh, cuts because we really couldn't. We just had to <laughs> produce more. <laughs> and of course, OPEC is having its uh, pound of flesh back. So we have to actually reduce our production 
for the next uh, few months. At the same time, prices are still trending upwards, which is good. So if we look at the combination of the economy also opening up now worldwide, I mean, in Nigeria by end of September, we believe things will be much uh, more open. We've all seen what the government is telling us it will be. I believe things are going to pick up and I would say a uh, you. But at the same time, we've been hearing about this second wave of COVID. I mean, I am keeping my fingers tightly crossed that it would never happen. But if that happens, definitely it might go worse and we will end up with a W shape, whereby we kind of dip back again before it slowly comes up. On the other hand, um, I would say V stands for vaccine. You know, if you want a V-shaped recovery, let there be a vaccine that somebody has been hiding and they just tell us about it by the end of this September. I don't want to mention some countries, the uh, president telling us that by October, <laughs> there'll be a vaccine ready for everybody to use. I mean, if that can happen, it's actually going to make the U trend more towards a V because recovery will be more rapid. I mean, a lot of the fears will be gone and there'll be more stimulation there'll be more opening, more production, and that is actually what makes the economy to tick. So in my own viewpoint, I think it's a U, but it can trend to a V, I mean, or a W, or an L, which God forbid, <laughs> that is, if a, non, a new pandemic strain comes, and that means we are dead, so we don't pray for that. But I'll say largely, I agree that it's more of a U that's going to happen. And as we know, too, overall, for the... Um, Nigerian situation, we've had to kind of have a lot of contraction. Everything depends on what happens in the oil revenue. It trickles. It's a value chain. So the more that can improve, the better the economy will open up. So that's All right. Enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Bashirana. I like the way you sort of concluded this. Uh, we can, it's a U for you, but it can be a V if there's a vaccine. I, I just like that. That kind of works. <laughs> and I mean, I heard the Russians have the vaccine already. So uh, and I heard it's London, Nigeria. So who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe just we might be getting a V. I'm going to move next to Rolake. Uh, Rolake, uh, I know you're a positive person. So <laughs> is, what's it going to be for you? Is it going to be a V? <laughs> I mean, thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation, Andrew, and wise words from uh, Mrs. Ojinewo Bashkrat, who I admire so much. So great to be here. But the reality is, um, I think possibly we'll run out of letters of the alphabet to describe the potential iterations of recovery for Nigeria. But the, the question I want to ask is, you know, I, I think about the country as someone who essentially is living above their means. And borrowing in a way that, or seeking to borrow in a way that may not be sustainable and seeking to design an economic construct that may not be sustainable. So I do wonder when we talk about recovery, the sustainability of whatever recovery we're going to see, because the fundamental structure of the economy has not changed. So regardless of the COVID pandemic, we've always been a cyclical economy because of the oil price and the, the export-driven focus on oil and the lack of value creation. So that recovery for me, in order to be sustainable, means that we have to learn lessons from the past. Um, I'm very, very concerned about the vulnerability in the long term. Um, I think if we look at where the global energy markets are heading, there's a major challenge there. I'm also looking at the quality of government spending. I mean, Andrew um, alluded to the 2.5%. And if you look at overall spending, even beyond just fiscal stimulus, I think we're about 7% of GDP compared to some of our other African counterparts. And, and so for me, there's, there's still a lack of an integrated and focused strategy in terms of infrastructure. Um, and really, from a recovery perspective, look, with the COVID pandemic, um, I think we really need to be looking at how we create uh, local consumption and generate demand locally for what we produce so that we're not so vulnerable. So I would love to see a U-shaped recovery, but the, the realism of what Nigeria is from an economic perspective today leads me to suggest it will be somewhere between a U-shaped recovery and a W-shaped recovery. Uh, something that continues to yo-yo depending on the external shocks and any other black swan events that we see. That would be my take. Having said that, I am fundamentally an optimistic person. And I think if you're a Nigerian, you have to be, otherwise you can survive 
So I'm looking forward to discussing in a bit more detail some of the, maybe the upsides and, that I see uh, despite that, that call on the recovery and the shape of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rulake. Um, I like the way you, you basically explained this out. Um, I mean, to be honest, this is a cyclical economy and, and I think uh, anybody who has been following this economy for years should know already that uh, it's always like that. Whenever oil prices goes up, uh, we seem to do better. Whenever oil prices uh, go down, the economy just goes down as well. So it's like it's perfectly correlated to, to oil. And that makes us basically uh, exposed to, you know, cyclical uh, effects. Um, so Rolake is saying she's positive, like I said, uh, U-shape. But, you know, she's also thinking, who knows, it might just be W. And W means that it's just going to be volatile. So we grow, we go back down and grow and just wobble out of, out of recovery. I'm going to go to, to, to Guy. Guy, are you going to be uh, optimist or um, are, you going to be in the, are you going to sit on the fence? Um, I'm going to be an optimist. Uh, so <laughs> first, I'm going to say thank you uh, to Ugo and Uade for um, having me on your show, which is a, a real pleasure. Um, enough to get me out of bed on a Saturday morning. And thank you to Andrew for his uh, presentation. I was taking notes, so that was cool. And uh, to Basharat and uh, Rolake. So I was actually given some notes um, ahead of this, and I said, and the notes said, will you kindly talk about um, foreign exchange and uh, foreign portfolio investments? So I'm going to keep to the narrow terms and quickly go through those. And then, I, and then I'm going to tell you the letter of the alphabet uh, that you all want to hear, I guess. So I think um, on foreign exchange, I, I think a really important thing is that it's not as bad as it was in 2016. And I think that's, mm. that's kind, of my, my kind of key point. If by the beginning of 2017, we had an official exchange rate at 316 and a parallel exchange rate, a parallel exchange rate at over 500. I mean, the distortion was absolutely incredible. And today it's not so bad. I mean, you've got, a, you've got an exchange rate uh, in the interbank market or the IME window or the NAFEX market. It, it, it trades under different names, uh, but it's around 385, sometimes, some days um, 388. And then the parallel rate last week, week ago was, was 477. So, not even 30% away. And then uh, the CBN uh, came in and took some measures to supply um, dollars to the Bureau de Change, uh, and it came down to 440. And, and the turnover in the parallel exchange rate, again, different from 2016, seems to be quite high. So I think, I think the foreign exchange distortions are not as large um, as they were. If, if you talk to industry and you, you, you go to your clients and say, would you go for a, a certain rate, uh, you know, as Andrew sort of hinted, a move to a market rate and, and then have a crawling peg maybe devalue by 2% every three months or something like that, they all say, yes, please, I could really handle that. I could settle, I would know where the exchange rate is in three months, which is what I really, really want. So I think. I think there is some sort of light at the end of the tunnel, but I think, you know, it's a rather complicated way of getting to that light. Um, on uh, foreign portfolio investment, which is the other topic that was put up in my notes, I, I just think it's like, yes, foreign portfolio investment is massively down purely due to the oil price. And I think we're trying to answer the wrong question. We shouldn't have to rely on portfolio investment uh, foreign portfolio investment to fund ourselves. And as uh, Rolake said, we're living beyond our means. So let's not borrow bunches of dollars from foreign investors on the promise that we can pay them back with future oil revenues. Uh, let's create domestic savings. And actually, this is happening. And this is why I am op op optimistic about this. You know, the pension fund industry has been growing for 10 years. So they're managing over 10 trillion in assets. And then if you look across to the managed funds, so what we call a collective investment schemes, uh, these funds are growing fast. Um, money market funds are up 11% in the first half of this year. Uh, fixed income funds were up 59% in the first half of this year. So the spending habit and the spend, and the, sorry, the, the, the savings bug is, is definitely there. But as Andrew says, you're actually robbing people because you're giving them an interest rate lower than inflation 
but nevertheless, this is a this is a trend, and I think people will save more uh, in in actual mutual funds, and and things will uh, grow from there. Because crucially, I I don't think the government has a solution. I think it's private sector savings, it's private ca private sector capital base, um, and creating a proper return on that investment that is going to drive things forward. Government is just too small. And with the best will in the world, the, the entire size of the budget um, is, is equivalent to about 8% of GDP. So when there's a huge stimulus, as, as Andrew said, it's 2% of GDP. You, you, you can't push a large economy with a small it's government. It just can't be done. So I think um, I'm optimistic. I think the private sector is responding uh, in some interesting ways. Um, savings seem to be going up despite the terrible interest rate uh, situation that we have. And I'm an optimist. Uh, I think we will um, get out of this. It will be a U-shaped uh, recovery, meaning that we'll be in recession uh, for three quarters at least, which includes Q, Q4, but around about um, Q1, more likely Q2 of next year, we will emerge. Uh, and we will emerge as a much smaller economy than we were a year ago, but we will emerge and the recovery will be a, a U shape. All right, thank you so much, um, um, Guy. Um, I had that U shaped. Um, we will emerge, that's what Guy says, we will emerge uh, sometime in Q1 or Q2. That's positive. Uh, I mean, I think I would take that. Um, if, if, if we emerge in Q1, like you, like you, you know, suggest, I think uh, that, that's not bad for us as, as an economy. Uh, I'm going to go next to Fola. Uh, Fola, uh, it would be interesting to hear from you, especially, uh, you know, from uh, perhaps you personally or from the AFC or, or, or multilateral institutions. How do you see Nigeria? Are you, are you seeing it from an optimistic uh, point of view or... Are you neutral? Because when you say neutral, neutral sounds a little bit pessimistic as well. <laughs> so uh, what's your take? No, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ugo. Um, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, we will always be optimistic about Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is where we are from originally. Nigeria is one of the most important markets and economies in Africa. So we'll always be optimistic. That's, that's the first uh, point to, to start with. Um, but it's important to also, you know, base, it, base things on facts. You know, Nigeria never really came out of the last uh, recession, if you think about it. Um, so um, we, we were uh, in the beginnings of a recovery, um, but that recovery uh, you know, never really took hold uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, and, you know, the way certainly I see things and, and a lot of the clients and investors that I work with who are keen on doing uh, business in Nigeria, uh, is that you know trade and investment are the only real path uh, out of uh, the economic slump that Nigeria finds itself uh, in. Uh, as I say, never really recovered, uh, and the only way out um, is trade and investment. Uh, if you think about it, something like 42% of our GDP uh, is made up of trade, telecoms, ICT, uh, food and beverage, tobacco, uh, as well as crude petroleum and natural gas. You know that's substantially the economy of Nigeria, um, and the key thing about the crop production, which we always talk about, is just about 20% of GDP as, as of the last numbers. But the core of the economy is trade, telecoms, ICT, food, beverage, tobacco, uh, as well as crude petroleum and natural gas, about 42%, as I said. And core to each of these sectors, including crop production, if you think about it, uh, is infrastructure and trade flows. You know, these are the lifeblood of, of these sectors uh, that, that are the core of Nigeria's uh, economy. Um, so government expenditure uh, is never going to be sufficient uh, to, to get Nigeria out of, a, uh, out of an economic slump. And I do think that over the last few years, a lot of the focus was on government uh, expenditure uh, and ways of boosting uh, consumption uh, locally. Uh, I don't think that you know, those are going to be uh, sustainable uh, as, as a route out uh, of the slump. Um, I think we, we have to understand that both uh, export and import trade uh, are good, uh, you know, as long as they're legitimate and they meet the needs of buyers and sellers within the economy, they are essential for uh, to happen. If we think about some of the, the countries where AFD has had the most success uh, in doing business, you know, one of our favorite countries where we, we've done very well, our investment team is Gabon. 
Uh, and one of my favorite statistics from Gabon, AFC has done extremely well in Gabon, I have to repeat it, and, and we love the country uh, very much. Uh, one of my favorite statistics, statistics about Gabon, apart from inflation, which, which is a, a very low number, is uh, investments as a percentage of GDP. It's 30% on average uh, investments as a percentage of GDP. Uh, compared with uh, Nigeria, where it's less than 14%, one four. Uh, if you think about some of the other countries that we look up to and admire, China, uh, about 40%, India, about 31% uh, on average, um, you know, Vietnam, about 27%, uh, Bangladesh, about 31%. Uh, and if Nigeria were to, you know, double uh, its uh, trade, uh, sorry, its investments as a percentage of GDP from 14 to about 28%, that works out to close to $60 billion uh, per annum in, in investment. And you can already understand how transformational that uh, would be, absolutely would be for, for the economy. Uh, so it's important to focus on drivers of trade and investment. These are the sources uh, where we see, we've seen success in other African countries. The investments in Gabon that I, I talked about was entirely about facilitating export trade uh, from, from Gabon. It was a special economic zone, it included a port, it included uh, you know, rail lines, it included a whole bunch of infrastructure. And that's the way forward. Everything that we can do to generate the $60 billion in additional annual investment uh, that will take our GDP, our investments as a percentage of GDP closer to countries like Gabon, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, India, uh, Vietnam, Bangladesh, that's absolutely what industrial strength can be built on. And if we do take that path, uh, and it's the path that we endorse in AFC, and we're working with multiple uh, clients and partners who are trying to do infrastructure investments to support that kind of achievement. Uh, if we follow that path, I think that the, the, um, the outcome that, that Andrew talked about at the beginning uh, of Nigeria being uh, the most important uh, transformational economic story of, of this century is a path that is potentially very uh, viable. All right, thanks, Ola. Um, so uh, uh, should I, should I um, put you on U-shape? I would love for it to be on you, <laughs> All right, thanks, Fola. Um, I, I think uh, there's so, something I picked from Fola is uh, Nigeria's uh, investment as a percentage of GDP at 14%. Uh, when you compare that to the likes of uh, Gabon at, at 30% and uh, China at, at 40%, incredible, incredible uh, stats there. And that just shows how much potential we have as a country in terms of attracting investment and why investment is important. Uh, to boost in Nigeria's uh, GDP growth rate. Uh, we have questions coming in as well. We're going to take some questions much later as we progress. Uh, but at the same time, the panelists, feel free uh, to respond to some of the questions that are directed at you uh, by the participants. I'm sure some of them are already fans already of you and uh, want to also share or hear from you uh, from specific views or comments that you may have made. Uh, we're going to go into the second as, um, you know, part of the questions here. And I'm going to come back to you, Andrew. And uh, on, in this segment, we'll focus a lot more on, on um, some of the, you know, what, what we say, what would term as controversial policies of the government uh, over the last few years. Um, so, Andrew, um, aside from COVID-19, um, people have pointed out, you know, border, border closure, uh, import substitution, uh, and then in multiple exchange rate, even though it looks like the government is collapsing uh, the exchange rate now, but still multiple as one of the you know, challenges of economic growth in Nigeria. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it was Rolake who talked about trade and how trade is important to you know, driving the economy forward. But uh, I think uh, um, Fola also mentioned how, why trade, telco, telecoms, and uh, I think he also mentioned uh, consumer goods as, as sectors in the economy that actually would drive economic growth in Nigeria. But we've seen a lot of these policies um, affect or people, you know, claim that it's affecting economic growth in Nigeria. What's your take on these policies and uh, will they, you know, lead us to the kind of growth that we're looking for or are we going to remain in tepid economic growth like we've seen in the last three years? Andrew. Yeah, no, I think that um, from our perspective, the, what, what's happened over the last, well, the decade I've been here is the government is, the federal government in particular, is too complex and there's too many programs. And the reaction, like if you look at what I put up before in the COVID-19 crisis, the vice president's uh, committee and reacting to that, the reflex in Nigeria is to create another program, another agency, another department, 
uh, that layers on. And then, you know, we don't kind of look at the effectiveness of this. So, I mean, we've advocated for quite some time now, the, the, you know, the number one word, if we had to give advice to the federal government in one word, it would be simplicity, right? And this, for those of us who sit on the private sector side of it, I mean, it's, I don't think it's too, too much to say that the government can be predatory in many ways, and particularly with this collapse in fiscal revenue by the government. They're you know, so desperate to, to shore up revenue. There's so many different taxes, levies. It's not clear. I mean, there was just a, a news article, I won't name the group, but about a Lagos uh, uh, officer who was removed from post because he imposed a 5% levy on his industry that was you know, deemed as irregular, let's put it that way. So we have this complexity and we have this predatory behavior that means people won't invest. And as Fola said, um, you know, other countries invest more. I mean, it's a mathematical certainty that if you invest 14% of your GDP per year in the in productively, that you will get GDP growth of 2% a year. So it means it's a mathematical certainty that um, uh, if 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 people if we don't change things, that we'll continue to have the country get poorer and poorer per capita. You know, we've always put out the number 26 to 29 percent to investment rate of GDP to get six to eight percent growth. Folas confirmed that with Gabon's sort of uh, number. That's just the mathematics of it. So the the way I would say this, you know, what, let's forget about you when know, the federal government stands up and says we've got trader money, we've got this program, that program. You know, that, they claim that is taking us to the 100 million people out of poverty. Our response to that is, look, you know, more people are getting into poverty, and it is because there's not enough investment, it's a certainty that more people will continue to go into poverty. So the only question the federal government should be asking themselves is why people won't invest in the greatest economic story of the century. And if we can solve that problem, you know, we're going to have a, a bright future. But for us, a lot of it's around simplicity, fewer agencies to deal with. And I think, you know, in this moment of truth, the government is aware of this, but what they've done is, again, the, you know, classic response. They've squeezed 25% out of the budget of each agency rather than say to themselves, does this agency actually add, does it actually need to exist? So we had the ORNSA report back in 2013. The president's actually signed it um, with the Minister of Finance a couple of months ago now. Are we going to see action in this moment of truth to simplify the way we do business? And part of it is obviously, and some people are commenting on the comments, you know, decentralization. So one thing we've really pushed is, you know, states taking responsibility for their own economic uh, uh, future. I mean, the, the, and that's true, certainly if we look at India, which is the closest parallel to, to the Nigerian situation, the, what really propelled India in the 1990s was states taking responsibility and the federal mm -hmm. government giving them the room. So those are some of the things that need to come. But business as usual, with the complexity that we have, the cost structure we have, as some people have commented on our, our governance, is going gonna, is gonna to mean people won't invest. And it's still, we're going to then continue to get poorer and poorer per capita. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm going to move straight to uh, Rola Kay. I mean, I, I heard some of the things that you said, uh, Andrew. And one that, that you know, caught my attention is without investment, more people are going to get back into poverty. And that's quite stark. Uh, and Rola Kay, Andrew also uh, had mentioned in his presentation, uh, it, it mentioned a lot about debt capital. And, uh, you know, real estate is one, is one sector where uh, a lot of people believe there's a lot of debt capital. And I think there's a lot more that can be, that can be done there. Real estate, like you very well know, is 5% of GDP. Uh, it's been in recession for a while. I, I think it contracted by 22% or so last quarter. Um, what role has uh, CBN's monetary policy and even some of government's policy um, you know, have or played in keeping real estate in where it is today? Because yeah. you have a lot of people who need homes, but yet uh, the appetite is there, but it appears that you know, being able to source that capital is not there, yet you now still have a lot of debt capital. You still have a lot of real estate out there in the country and no one is in there. So what role has the government played in all of this and what, how can we get it better? Okay, thanks for that question. I mean, I think the, the answer is quite multifaceted because there's the consumer side, there's the developer side, there's the construction side, you know, it's, it's a whole ecosystem. But let's even just look at what has happened to the space recently. So Q2 was the fifth consecutive quarter, I think, we saw a contraction in the real estate sector. So over the, the past nine quarters, basically, it's been literally growth that has been declining and has been negative. Let's start with the monetary side and the FX side. Um, obviously, the weakening of the domestic currency has impacted inflation, interest rates. And from an affordability perspective, clearly that translates into higher mortgage payments. So on the consumer side, the demand for loans and housing has been impacted. 
And then for those who obviously are, own a large number of assets in Nigeria, especially with USD loans backing them, this has been a major challenge. And then there's the deployment of capital for investment. I think if you look at it, I would argue that the fundamentals of investment, the investment case for many projects have been altered because of this economic environment. And FX volatility has meant, look, developers themselves are facing higher prices. Um, and this is a major challenge for, for our space. So the question is, do you as a developer wait and see until the market stabilizes? Or are you going to look at pressing ahead with your projects with, with FX um, situation? The one thing I would say is that I, I think infrastructure investment as a whole, if done right and qualitatively, it's like this virtuous cycle that then creates, generates demand, and then creates an even broader and more sustainable revenue base, i.e. tax collection and et cetera. So that's been one of the areas of challenge that we've seen. And then obviously giving the impact on consumer pockets, you know, we're seeing steep pay cuts, uh, we're seeing transition to remote working, some aspects of the commercial, retail, and the high-end market have obviously been impacted. Then let's look at government spending. Let's look at government spending across the board. One of the issues that we think is very critical is really around the underserved segment housing as an asset or real estate as an asset class it's not this esoteric thing right so it's really about people's ability to afford a home so we've seen an impact on individual and household income so the question for someone who wants to play or invest in this space is in this climate is what part of the market should i target i think there's obviously a hugely on underdeveloped mortgage sector but let's, let's break it down. 78% of Nigeria's population today ends less than $100 a month, right? So the mortgage market we have today from a financing perspective does not adequately serve that middle income bracket. And if you look at across Africa, the lowest cost houses in Africa by, that will be developed by companies like, say, Amixta, other developers, will probably only be affordable to about 15% of the population in most urban areas. Because from a developer perspective, we're seeing that an increase in costs, in construction costs, in finance costs. So we need additional incentives that will further unlock investment. And whilst I'm an advocate of qualitative government spending in key infrastructure, I also don't think it should crowd out private infrastructure. I think it should help to unlock or trigger or de-risk the business environment in such a way that private investment is more incentivized to participate. So those are some of the challenges we face. Of course, there are solutions and there are other opportunities to create change and, and transform the entire real, real estate and affordable housing space. But for me, the FX situation has been key. The cost of sourcing raw materials as well has been particularly key. Thanks a lot, Rolake. Um, you, you talked about additional incentives. Uh, I know we're running out of time. We're almost one hour already, and we still have loads of questions to go. But I need to hold you on this one. Could you be specific, a little bit more specific, on the kind of incentives that you think real estate needs? Okay, well, I think we need partnerships. So if you look at real estate development, what makes up the cost of developing uh, mass housing, for instance? Your construction costs and your land costs are huge. We are thankfully quite lucky at Mixta that we have an extensive land bank. So access to land or title to land has not been an issue. So we need to find partnerships in the public private sector, for instance, for mass housing projects where the government can bring the land as equity, which overall brings down the cost of investment. Mm. Um, over the last few years, we've also seen the evolution of the National Housing Fund, NHF, by the uh, Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria, which means that those who want to build their own homes have access to interest rates for mortgages at 7% 7, 7 or below. Um, and, and when we look at sort of the role that government plays, the investment in infrastructure is not to say, you know, come and build a, a development with me, but what about the roads? What about the transit points that then mean that in this climate, from an urban perspective, people don't feel the need to necessarily live close to work because the ancillary infrastructure around real estate is also developed. So you could argue that the government has a role to play, the private sector has a role to play. And of course, incentivizing investment in local industry so that we're not sourcing all inputs from China, given what has happened with global supply chains. I think these are some of the business environment incentives that I'm talking about. Um, and then of course, the financial ecosystem 
we need more financial intermediaries in place in Nigeria's mortgage system. And we're already seeing extensive partnerships in the public sector on that front. But those would be some of the initiatives I would point to. All right, thanks, Olake. Um, some good, good points there in terms of incentives um, that the real estate sector needs. I mean, this is a very important sector in the country. And what kind of shocked me is that 78% uh, of Nigerians earn less than $100. And, <laughs> and these are the kind of guys you're saying you want to give uh, that probably need, uh, need housing. How are, you gonna, how, are they, how are they gonna afford housing with the kind of mortgage structures that we have in the country? Uh, I'm gonna move um, straight to uh, Fola. Uh, Fola, uh, you heard Rolake talk about you know, the role CBN can play here. And uh, a lot of people have talked often about the exchange rate management. Uh, it's a sore point for a lot of uh, investors, particularly foreign investors, uh, how the CBN is managing exchange rate. The CBN on the other hand, uh, cites heterodox policies and they think that uh, you know, so long as uh, we are a developing economy, emerging economy in sub-Saharan Africa, we've, have to, we've got to be able to develop our own homegrown economic policies, which they've termed the terrorist policies. Uh, so for you, you know, from the outside, uh, even though you're in the inside as well, uh, is there a middle ground between homegrown economic policies and policies that are well known to everyone that, you know, like Rulake has said, the ones that have worked in India or the ones that have worked in uh, in, uh, in Vietnam or in other emerging markets economies? Is there a middle ground? What should the CVN be doing now in terms of managing, uh, in terms of exchange rate management? Which policy do you think would work for us? Thanks. Um, thanks, uh, Ugo. I think that it's, it's really not a, a subject of debate. Um, I don't believe it's a subject of debate. What is, the, what is the way forward? I think that if you talk to all of the, you know, the, the you know, most important and the most knowledgeable uh, ec economists and, and business people who are uh, doing uh, work in Nigeria, if you talk to any investor that is serious uh, about uh, making investments in Nigeria, um, it's very important that there be liquidity. You know, liquidity, uh, you know, uh, foreign exchange liquidity is the single most important thing uh, from the perspective of anybody that is, is doing business in, uh, in, in, in a country like Nigeria. Um, and it's important, you know, that you have an environment uh, that is liberal uh, and an environment that allows uh, for foreign exchange to be available. Uh, I mean, price uh, is, is a separate uh, matter, uh, but I think the availability uh, is probably the, the more important uh, consideration because that's what allows trade happen. And that's what allow, uh, allows investment happen. That's what allows folks bring in capital, repatriate capital. Um, it's because uh, there's liquidity. And in the absence of liquidity, you kind of stunt uh, the market, both the financial market as well as the underlying uh, core uh, economic market. I mean, we are working with, with multiple investors uh, right now who are looking at uh, a number of transformational infrastructure projects in, in Nigeria across sectors, you know, rail, pipelines, roads, dams, uh, telecoms, ports, uh, trade infrastructure, uh, all of the, these um, sectors require foreign uh, direct investment. And so it requires an openness uh, to new ideas uh, and, uh, and a liberal environment uh, around uh, foreign currency availability. So, I mean, to answer your question uh, in a more uh, simplistic form, I don't think we can get away without having a market that is liberal and open uh, and, that, and where and the supply uh, is an important driver of, of, uh, of prices. Um, and that's the way it works, uh, you know, everywhere uh, where development uh, is happening in the world. And, and that's the way it has to work. Uh, so I'm all for homegrown uh, policies, fully supportive of homegrown policies. In other words, taking things that have worked elsewhere in the world and situating it within our context, within the reality of our local market. But there are some fundamental principles that are the same everywhere in the world. Uh, on, on demand and supply uh, is one of those uh, factors. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it, it, it does, Fala. Thanks so much. Uh, I mean, if I hear you clearly, uh, yes, homegrown policies are good, but at the end of the day, no matter what you call it, liquidity is what's important, and that's what the market needs. People want to be able to en enter and then exit. Uh, so when you have illiquidity in the market, things just can't work, no matter how well or how, how, how good your intentions are. And that is very important. I'm going to go straight to Guy now. And Guy had mentioned earlier uh, that the Forex situation now is not as bad uh, as it is in 2016. And he also said, we probably do not, you know, need to rely a lot on FPI uh, in Nigeria. But then, um, you know, as an emerging economy, you do need FDI. 
uh, and a little bit of API. You need that balance. So, so Guy, uh, you know, what exactly do, uh, you know, foreign, foreign FDIs and F FPIs really need? Uh, are they looking for yield or are, are they really looking for value in an emerging market like Nigeria? What do they want? So my, my point about FPI is that we are, you know, if we take all foreign investment into this country, foreign direct investment, so what we might call um, investment in things, you know, investment in companies, is a very small por portion of, of it. And the majority has been foreign portfolio investment, which mainly means buying government securities, where government issues an IOU, um, which we have to pay back later um, with revenues from oil. So that's what I have against um, F FPI. In, in terms of what those investors want, um, you know, I, I think if you earn, we've done some study in this in coronation asset management, uh, if you earn a 9.2% return in Naira, you're actually making up over the long term for your devaluation against the dollar. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a minimum 9.2% percent uh, return because that will protect them in dollars and then if they get a return on top of that um, which over the course of time they have done then they're getting a dollar return but my point is they're getting that dollar return from the Nigerian public sector from the government so that's probably not you know the best use of, uh, of those funds. I, I think there's an elephant in the room I think um, we've mentioned this thing of sort of you know liquidity. It's very, very important. I, I happen to believe that Nigeria is full of capital. There's masses of capital everywhere. Um, there's real estate. Now, the real estate isn't, isn't transacting a lot, which is why the real estate, as, as we mentioned, you know, is in recession for a long time. But the value of it is huge. Try, try buying a flat in Lagos or Abuja. So it's a matter of getting that uh, transaction rate up. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the kind of key thing is a degree of deregulation, um, access to credit. And, and I think then you start to sort of unlock. And when I mean deregulation, I think we do talk a lot and we're possibly getting into a trap of talking about things that have to be done. Um, and I prefer to, about, to talk about things that can be undone. Um, you know, a willing buyer, willing sector, uh, willing buyer, willing seller approach and a pre market price in the power sector, for example, undo the regulation in the power sector, and you set the capital free. So that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're saying private investment, you know, uh, into this country is actually very small. Um, if you unlock some of the restrictions and the power sector seems to be a very good example where it seems to be crippled by a fixed price. Uh, if you had a market price there instead, then I think the investment would flow and you unlock the massive capital that, that we have here. Thank you so much, Guy. Um, I, I like the way you kind of ended this. Uh, if we undo the regulation in, in the power sector, uh, you know, we would basically free the economy, uh, whether it's willing buyer, willing seller, or whatever they call it. But what's important is we have to undo a lot of reg regulations that are stifling the sector. So I'm going to move to Basharat now. And, and this actually segues well. Uh, into the question uh, you know, I had for you, Basharat. We, we've seen some, some policies from the government uh, lately, and it appears that maybe this is the first step uh, in trying to undo uh, some of the control that they have on the economy, whether it's, it's a World Bank instigated action or whether it's an action that the government has always wanted to do. We don't know, but um, we've seen actions. We've seen uh, electricity tariffs uh, go up, uh, and government has allowed that to go. Uh, we've also, even though it's partially, uh, from what we understand. We've also seen uh, fraud prices as well. Uh, they call it price modulation. We've seen that happen uh, as well lately. Uh, are there any other you know, you know, policy moves or uh, uh, should I call it on due regulation or lesser control that we should be expecting from the government from your point of view? Okay, uh, thanks very much, Ugo. I'm happy you said from my point of view because if I was government, I mean, I have a lot of things that I definitely will do. You know, you started off, like you said, you know, the World Bank has already advised us we need to deepen reforms in this country. That is the only way to boost the growth and revenues. And if we don't do that, it's like we're just burying our head in the sand. 
you know, and some of the things you mentioned, it's not recent uh, policy moves. I mean, how long have we been talking about deregulation? Probably over 10, 15 years. But sure. I, mean, uh, I think it was Andrew that said it. This is the moment of truth for the country. Mm. We cannot afford to pay subsidies. I know it has been very painful for everyone. I mean, I see a lot of grumbling in the media, in chat rooms. Everybody feels it's the height of wickedness on the part of the government. And the only thing is, if government can also prove that some of all these revenues from the removal of the subsidy is going to go into development of other areas of the economy, I think people will kind of go a little bit softer in, in the way they go. Also, when you talk about the price uh, review for the power, it's also long overdue. I mean, cost-reflective tariff has been on for a long time. We all know that the power and the will to do it has been missing. But yet, this is another issue of it just has to be done. I mean, if that doesn't happen, things won't go ahead. But if I talk particularly about the oil and gas uh, industry, I think the most important policy move that the government has to engage, put pressure on the legislature, wherever it is, is the PIB bill. If we can get that PIB bill out as a government, mm. if I am government, I mean, it's something I would want done this year unfailingly. This has been on for 17 years. And obviously, you can imagine the kind of, um, should I say, uh, horse trading that has been going on at the back. And, you know, I have a lot of clients in the industry. And that is why when you talk about CapEx, when you talk about new projects, they just don't want to embark on it. Because when you start, you don't even know where you'll finish. There are multiplicity of taxes. There are multiplicity, uh, multiplicity of agencies. So you end up, I mean, just uh, investing at, at the end of the day. It's a negative. If the PIB uh, bill comes out, at least it would help in the unbundling of NNPC. It would privatize. It will do more of commercialization. It would at least let there be more transparency. And that is the most important thing that this sector needs. A sector that contributes over 90% of your revenues must be transparent. So for me, that is the most important thing that should be done. Then one of the things that is already happening, which is good, is the marginal uh, oil field uh, rounds that are going on. So far, it has been conducted transparently. And I think that is why it has generated so much interest. We all know that over 600 uh, companies have applied. And even with a $130,000 per company, where you are not even sure you will get anything, it shows the level of commitment and at the same time, when the signature bonuses start coming in and all that, it's going to be a very huge drive. So I think for government, they need to be able to do more of promoting indigenous um, uh, marginal players. At the same time, ensure there's transparency on bundle uh, NMPC so that we can incentivize FDIs. If that alone happens in the industry, it can actually triple at a minimum the expectations there. So. That is one thing I want to leave with government as a major challenge and something that should be done as fast as possible. There is no need revamping refineries. I mean, we have, like we said, we have Dangote, we have some small players coming in. We all know something was recently signed to revamp. And I was wondering, I mean, why are we doing this? Let it be privatized. Let the people who can run it, run it, you know. And I think those kind of policy changes of making sure that things are sustainable and at a commercial nature would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bashirat. I think uh, you basically, uh, you know, made the point there. We need deeper reforms. Uh, we need to get PIB done. We've been talking about this for 17 years. Uh, the marginal oil field rounds is good. We need to encourage it more, encourage especially local uh, oil players. We also need to unbundle the NNPC and also, you know, consider privatizing refineries. The interesting thing is, these are things that we've been talking about for years now. And all we're saying is do it, do it, because if this is a sector that contributes 90% of government revenues, then why are we all wasting time? What is delaying us? Why can't we just move? Uh, interesting, guys. Uh, imagine, we, we, looks like there's an emerging theme already uh, in the conversation so far. Uh, for what I can deduce uh, in summary, uh, basically it's increased private investment, 
uh, government expenditure, expenditure is not sufficient, so we need to increase uh, private sector investment. Government needs to be more of an enabler. That's basically the theme uh, the panelists are seeing here. Government needs to be more of an, an enabler. Uh, we need to also allow liquidity in the system, let the market to reign. We've also heard that as well. And then, also, of course, deregulation. We need to also you know, break that shackle down, let the market basically dictate. Uh, we move to the, to the next round of questions. And we're going to focus a bit more on government policy again as well, because I think it's pretty much important for all of us to get this right. Uh, please keep, keep sending your questions in. We will take questions after this round. Uh, uh, after, after this round of questions, we'll take questions from participants as well. Uh, I think the, the, the guys in the admin are working on that. Uh, closely. So they're going to send me some questions I'm going to take. So I'm going to go straight to you, Fola, uh, this time. Uh, concessionary funding, we know how important that is. Uh, I, I was listening to the, to the Minister of Finance, uh, I think sometime in June or July at, at, the, at an event organized by Citibank, and she had said that Nigeria wasn't going to look for, uh, you know, the, there wasn't going to be any euro bond this year. The focus will be on concessionary uh, funding. Uh, you know, concessionary funding is, is critical uh, to injecting stimulus in the economy. Uh, but it appears that Nigeria is struggling. Why are we struggling to get money from the World Bank? We've been talking about this since February. I think that February was when the World Bank uh, initiated. They actually did initiate uh, this move from what we've read. But we're in September and we still haven't gotten this funding. We were only able to secure $3.4 billion from, uh, um, from the IMF what's going on? Thank you. I mean, I can't speak specifically to the situation with the World Bank. Um, you know, I've seen some public information around there being uh, some demands by the bank uh, on the government that the government had not yet fulfilled. Uh, I've seen some angst and disappointment on, on government side because the government um, wanted uh, those with that facility to be um, you know, not very conditional uh, on, on changes uh, to, to economic policy uh, and wanted it more as a COVID relief uh, facility. Um, however, it appears, and I'm, I'm just going based on what I've seen in, in the public domain, it appears that the World Bank is, is attaching some conditionalities um, to the facility uh, that the government is now only now trying to, to meet uh, so that it can access the, the funding. Um, you know, from our perspective, working in, in infrastructure and, and in development finance uh, in Nigeria, we think that, you know, one of the best ways to, to catalyze uh, concessional uh, or low-cost low uh, international financing, uh, whether it's from the World Bank or it's from export credit agencies or the Africa Development Bank uh, or any number, you know, the U.S. Development Bank, uh, the U.K. Development Bank, you know, there's quite a number of uh, international uh, multilateral financiers who are extremely keen uh, on opportunities in Nigeria. But the best way to get it is to tie it to projects. You know? So I think that there's a bit of um, exhaustion around just general uh, government uh, budget financing um, that is not tied uh, to specific projects. The challenge with tying it to projects is that you have to do a bit of work on the projects, on, on preparing the projects to be the beneficiaries of the financing. The good news is that there are quite a few such uh, initiatives that are going on at the moment. Uh, there's one going on uh, on roads, uh, there's one going on on pipelines, um, and uh, obviously there's, there's a Siemens uh, program that is going on uh, on electricity. So that's the way um, to catalyze uh, these sources of, of financing uh, and to make them less dependent on policy conditionalities, because if you want just general government budget funding, then you're going to be uh, at the at the you know beck and call uh, of of the bureaucrats who who dispense that financing, and they're going to say they want X Y Z or else a no financing. However, if you tie it to projects, you know viable projects, projects that are well structured and meet um, the criteria that both foreign and domestic investors are looking for, not only can you catalyze multilateral and export credit financing, but you can also catalyze private investment uh, from you know, sponsors, from financial investors, from even uh, regional investors like ourselves uh, who have substantial access to foreign currency financing and are looking for projects uh, to fund. So I do think we need to, as a government, as a country, change our strategy and, and tie um, our demands for, for financing 
uh, two specific projects. All right, thanks, Paula. Um, I'm going to still hold on to you, though. Um, I, I like the way you sort of explain this out. Uh, tying financing to project is actually very key, and I think uh, that is what a lot of regional, uh, you know, fund providers like like AFC, ADB, are typically done. And I think the World Bank is also looking in that direction lately. Now, one other, one other, you know, maybe <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I can say the word controversial, you know, uh, you know, country that sort of also leverages on on tying financing to project, even though it's very cheap, is China. A lot of people are a little confused about how China actually gives out funding to Nigeria. Uh, do you want to maybe just clarify a little bit? Is, it, is there any uh, difference in the way they give funding to, you know, maybe African countries or Nigeria compared to maybe the guys like ADB or AFC or any other uh, regional fund providers? I mean, there are nuances. Um, you know, AFC is a beneficiary of Chinese financing ourselves. We, we, we receive okay. uh, significant lines of Chinese uh, uh, export uh, banks and uh, development banks. Um, China is an important source of financing for Africa. I mean, probably the most important source of financing for Africa at the moment. Um, you know, your question, uh, is there any difference between the way they look at things and the way, you know, the more traditional sources like the World Bank, ADB, uh, look at things. Increasingly, uh, not so much. I think over the last decade or so, there was a boom uh, in, in Chinese financing um, that was driven by uh, Chinese export, uh, uh, you know, export objectives uh, as much as anything else. Um, and um, that was taken advantage of by many countries, including Nigeria. You've seen the impact on, on the railways uh, and, and a number of uh, government projects in Nigeria. But you know, it's a method that is increasingly coming under scrutiny uh, in China as well as, as, as domestically uh, in Nigeria and in Africa. Um, and it's not as easy to accomplish as it, as it used to be. Um, you'll see uh, increasingly that you know, there are demands for very strong government guarantees uh, around the payment uh, for these facilities. Um, they're not quite project tied. They're essentially government loans um, that are just being implemented by, by an international partner. Um, on the other hand, you also see that the Europeans uh, have come to understand that this is a method of financing that, that Africans and uh, Nigeria likes. And so they're also beginning to adapt um, their funding solutions to look a bit more like, like, the, like the Chinese solutions. At the end of the day, we have to be open to everything. And the most important thing is to find important projects, transformational projects that make an economic impact to set up those projects so that they are viable for financing, and then to invite partners from all over the world to, to work with us uh, to finance these projects. This has to be the way uh, forward. So I'm, I'm a big fan of you know, some of what has been achieved uh, with Chinese financing uh, across the continent. It's improving, it has to improve, it has to become more stringent, more environmentally focused, and there are any number of other areas of concern, um, but it can be improved and that's the way forward. All right, thank you so much for our well, well spoken. Uh, we're going to move next um, straight to uh, Guy. Um, Guy, I, I know that I've, I've got you on the hook for for investments and and FPIs. Uh, you you you've, you said a lot about this already, but um, to actually get us out of this this quagmire that we find ourselves in, we do need we do need FDIs, uh, and we actually do need FPIs. You know that FDIs take their time to come in. Uh, but if there's any fund that actually comes in quickly, it's FPIs. And uh, even if we, even if it's, you know, in the short term, we do need them to come back in uh, at least uh, to help with our exchange rate situation. What should the CBN be doing to attract FPIs? Anything they can do now, even if it's just in the short term. I know you don't really subscribe to that, but I, I do think, you know, to an extent, you know, we do need a little bit of FPI, at least just to help with liquidity management and exchange rate management. What should we be doing to attract them? Ugo, I, I think you're right. I'm probably taking a rather puritanical view, and I think you're taking a more pragmatic view than I am. Um, but, but let me just quickly take, take a step back, because it occurs to me there's something that we've all possibly left behind, which is that during 2016 and 2017, certain lessons were learned. And structural reform is always difficult to get through, it takes a long time to happen. Uh, and takes years, whereas the currency crisis can be cooked up in a matter of months. But there is more vertical integration at the food manufacturers in this country, uh, in starch manufacturers and, and elsewhere. 
and, and also there are more uh, industrial plants uh, willing to export. I was talking to an exporter the other day who's furious because not because he can't import his raw materials through a PAPA, because he can't get his exported uh, products out towards the Cote d'Ivoire when he has orders. So I think there's some structural reforms that came through in 2016 um, and 2017. It is a slow burn, um, but uh, uh, it will pay off. And I think, I think we need to be um, aware of, of, of that. But, but principally, the private sector does react and does react extremely well. On this question of FPI, you know, it's, it's like, there are always funds out there, and there are quite a small number of funds globally to whom we talk, of course, you know, who will invest in Nigeria and buy, uh, buy Naira securities um, and get a decent return on those. And it's a matter of um, settling the FX issue once and for all, well, at least for the next few years, settling the FX issue. Don't forget, in August 2017, uh, the parallel rate, um, which I keep on going on about, but the parallel rate <laughs> and the NAPEX rate merge, and they stuck. Yes. They stuck at the same rate for another two years, and the FPI poured in. And so if you want to be pragmatic, and I know, Ugo, you are, you know, then it, as long as you solve the FX problem, and it does seem that the CBN this week is, or the last week, has been taking some big steps in that direction, then the, FX, uh, then the FX problem can be solved um, and the FPI will flow. And of course, interest rates then need to be a little bit higher for those investors. So obviously at you know, 2 3%, it's not going to work. Um, but, but at a higher rate, um, that would draw in for, uh, foreign portfolio investment. All right, thanks so much, Guy. I, I, I recall very well that the last time uh, the CVN solved the FX problem. It was basically being able to merge the parallel market rate and the FX rate. Uh, something else the CVN also did to hold FX rates uh, that stable for a long time. I also keep FPIs uh, into Nigeria it was uh, OMO policy, the CVN OMO policy. Those interest rates were mouth watering and that kept uh, investors in. But we're going to pivot, pivot now to, uh, to Rulake. Um, Rulake, um, mass, mass housing, mass housing. Uh, this is something that is pertinent. Uh, to me, I think that if you read a lot of the stats, I've had numbers like 20 million housing deficits. I've seen 26. I'm, I still don't know who authored that report, but it's been quoted widely that we have about 20 million uh, housing deficits in 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 in, uh, in 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 Nigeria. But you know, you do know that in in countries like the United States, you know, housing is is critical to that economy. Uh, once you start to see housing problems, then the American economy tanks. How can Nigeria get there? What 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 are those things that, I know you spoke a little bit about it earlier, but in terms of specifics now, how do we get mass housing solved? Because we do need mass housing, don't we? We do need mass housing desperately. So how can we get it solved? Like, even if it's within the next five years, in, in, you know, like just point us to some kind of direction. Okay, thanks for that, Ugo. I think I'd started talking about it in the previous segment, but I probably didn't go into detail. So I just wanted to establish two things. You know, with, with housing, it's one of two things, no matter where you are in the world. Housing, for some people, is aspirational. For some people, it's an investment prospect, right? So wherever you sit on that spectrum, the fact is in Nigeria, we have a major deficit, anywhere from 17 to 20 million. But the problem is that the way we've been approaching the segment has not been meeting the needs of the mass market. What do I mean by that? And I gave you statistics. I said earlier, 78% of the Nigerian population earns less than $100 a month, which means that if we have a mortgage market where you're serving a, an income segment where people need to buy houses of up to 30 million naira, for instance, that is not going to work. So one of the things that we're trying to impress upon the government is let's look at the micro mortgage and housing microfinance market. All the houses that we're building, in fact, let, let's break it down. The Center for Affordable Housing uh, Institute in Joburg estimates that 75% 75, 75 of the housing stock in all of Africa is actually self-built, which means that if most people in Africa cannot afford to purchase a conventional mortgage as it is, there's an opportunity for the micro mortgage segment. Because what happens is that when incomes go down, then that entire segment that we 
think we're targeting now is completely destroyed. So we actually need to look at the financial ecosystem that goes with that. So that's the first uh, side on which we need to shoot. Then we obviously need to look at interest rates. Can we introduce public sector DFI partnerships that help de-risk that space and incentivize investment? And we have to make distinct, there's affordable housing and there's social housing. Now in the space that I work, the affordable housing segment you could argue is sort of 10 million Naira. That's the ideal, to, to really be affordable. Uh, 10 to 15 million Naira. And then social housing is really sub that. You cannot do social housing, which is essentially mass housing, without government intervention. You need the government to do that. And we need to be looking at the profile of the individuals we serve and then create financial products, partnering with DFIs and all those who can provide that long-term capital, which then brings me to this whole second issue. And this is an area that I'm particularly passionate about. One of the major challenges we see in Nigeria is access to single digit long-term Naira financing. This is a problem that pervades not just the construction sector, the real estate sector. If you look at those who develop gas infrastructure, it is extremely capital intensive. Projects need longer grace periods on debt to fully complete construction, to be fully de-risked and to be ready to be in a state to serve the target market. So we need to tap into that. The other thing is, I would say, is really looking at the credit enhancement side of things. I think there's a need to more leverage structures that people, uh, institutions like InfraCredit, Garanco are, are putting out there. But also we have a huge pension market that can, in, even in asset classes that serve underserved markets, it is not inconceivable to realize returns. It is just the way those structures are. And you know, we have, we have a demographic sweet spot because we don't have huge dependency ratios in Nigeria, which means our pension pot as it, is, as it stands today is actually a sustainable source of long-term financing locally. So those are two key things that I think we can do when it comes to mass housing both on the development and construction side, but also creating mortgage products that work for that part of the market. And one of the things we are doing at Mixta, for instance, we have a product called Mixta Flex, which introduce flexible payment terms for the equity portion of mortgages. So not just the ability to pay your debt portion amortized over a long-term period, but you know the down payment you often have to make as part of a mortgage obligation we now have created a structure that allows you to pay that over time. So the, the private sector mm. is trying to play its part, but I think mm. we need to see more concerted partnerships with the public sector to make this uh, a realizable prospect. And then the final point I would really make with, with regards to the, the issue of mass housing. Housing does not happen in isolation. Housing is situated in the context of a network of general infrastructure. So if we're developing mass housing, but we're not developing mass transit, mass transport system, the railway system, then it's essentially, it's like filling a basket with water. You know, it's, it's a thankless task because these are the things that create, that create uh, urban communities that allow industry and cities to thrive. I think those would be the main points that I, I want to uh, put forward. Thank you so much, Rolake. Um, I, I think there's a lot of nuggets that you dropped here that I like. And I think the last one also resonates with me that uh, mass housing is not just something that, you know, you, ca you can take in isolation. It has to be integrated to a lot of things as well. And I also like what you said Mixta is doing. So if you're trying to get a property or you're trying to get a house, that down payment, they can allow you um, sort of like make it over time. And then uh, you can then also access uh, the full mortgage later. That's, that's, that's quite interesting. But I'm going to just stick to you, Rolake, just a little bit more. I know that time is not on our side. We still have a lot of questions, but I think this is very important. Uh, there was something Lagos State did uh, several years ago. I remember growing up, I think it was on that Jack on Day, and, and there was a lot of mass housing back then. We saw a lot of all those Jack on Day houses across Lagos, and, and that kind of served a lot of, at, at least I know I had a lot of friends then whose parents were civil servants who got a lot of those houses. Uh, Lagos State has also done something similar, I think with Lagos Homes or so, even though it appears uh, that is like a middle class, uh, you know, kind of uh, arrangement. So is it possible to replicate something like that with the private sector as co-partnership? 
uh, with, 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 say, Lagos State government or state governments who have this kind of mass housing deal? Is, it, is, that, is that kind of uh, project possible in these times? Yes, and uh, absolutely possible. And, and I think I, I alluded to the fact that let's look at what makes up the structure of any development or housing project. You know, you have your land, you have your construction, you have your ancillary infrastructure. You, you need to find ways to bring down the cost of each of those, essentially to risk it from a project perspective. So I think one of the things that the government should really start looking at is um, for the existing housing stock that maybe has been redundant and lying fallow, we can leverage those assets to do something. And I, I know we've been talking about the National Asset Registry in Nigeria for a long time, but I think there's a lot we can do that. For, now, for new developments, I think we should definitely look at partnering. Ikiti recently did something like that with some uh, civil construction companies where they essentially provided the land for the developers so that the developers were able to create a product that was more affordable. Because mm. when you're looking at your product pricing buildup and how you price the costs of your development, you have to take into account all these elements. So if land as equity from the government is the investment they make, you know, we're already 50% of the way there. I think the second thing we, we need look, to look at more creatively and innovatively is sustainability. Because I used to work in the energy sector and I, I now work in affordable housing, it's really around energy efficiency and what is sustainable living. Because for the average Nigerian, it's not just the cost of purchase that is the issue, it's your long-term sustainability to finance the home that you're living in. So there are other elements we can look at around, you know, sourcing cheaper raw materials locally, closer to centers of development, looking at more energy efficient solutions, looking at the power infrastructure in that area, i.e. Mm. bringing down the overall cost of electricity for consumers and having efficient markets that thrive on demand and supply. Those are some of the things that I would say. And then finally, it's really around the housing stock that we do have. If we're looking to raise long-term capital, can we leverage or sell some of these assets? And, and this cuts across public bureaucracy. If you look, almost every state government has abandoned housing stock that is lying in Lagos, for instance. We all see it everywhere we go. These are some of the things that we can really try to do. And I have to cite Lagos here. If you look at the Lagos 2020 budget, there was about 700 billion that was allocated for capital expenditure and 400 billion roughly for recurrent expenditure. So you have like something like a 60, 61, 60, 40 percent ratio of capital to recurrent, which shows that infrastructure actually represents 10 percent of the total budget and 16 percent of capital expenditure. So I think that there is something to be said there in terms of the way state governments and subnationals focus on capital spending. And if we can really kind of continue to drive that sort of structure and strategy, I think we're a long way there because what it means that we're pulling larger sources of capital and with the right policies for the business environment and incentives, then we can actually invest more qualitatively in the right type of infrastructure that meets the mass housing market, for instance. Thank you so much, Orlake. Uh, brilliant, brilliant submissions there. Uh, I, I hope that they are listening to you. Uh, I want to believe that they are. Uh, we did send send this webinar around and we hope that some government officials are listening because these are incredible nuggets here. And if you're looking at affordable housing in Nigeria, Rulaki has basically just laid the marker here for anybody who is interested. Uh, we're going to move, we're supposed to move to Andrew, but I'm going to take Andrew after Bashirat. Let me just switch it a little bit uh, so that I can link this very well. Uh, Bashirat, I'm going to segue into you here. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about government and enrollment in in whether it's infrastructure development or uh, unlocking investments in the country or uh, facilitating, facilitating investment through uh, you know, better policies or you know, allowing markets to flow. But banks have also got a role to play in all of this. Um, commercial banks today uh, are by far, in fact, I was looking at the GDP numbers and the financial services sector, which is basically the banks, basically grew by double digits uh, in, in Q2, surprisingly. So um, what role uh, you know, has banks got to play in stimulating economic growth? Uh, of course, we've seen the CBN try to coerce bank through uh, the, the, the uh, not so popular uh, LDR and CRR policies, uh, you know, but then they've also come with, uh, you know, credit bureau and the GSI, which is the global standing credit, just to also help banks, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, protecting them against loan defaults. Uh, however, we do need banks at some point. Banks need to help 
Uh, we, you know, a lot more with power. To be honest, banks have, have been there as well. Power, you know, refineries. You talked about government allowing refineries uh, to go. Uh, banks do have a role there. Uh, midstream oil and gas and also mining. So, Bashura, what should banks be doing now, especially this time? Because we need banks more than ever. Okay, yeah. Thanks very much, Ugo. And I think, first of all, let me make it clear. We banks were there as a catalyst and promoters of growth. We are also actually, you know, that's the way we make money. If we don't lend money, we don't make money. So contrary to what some people think, sometimes we actually want to make the economy grow as fast as possible. And I also want to have a little bit of a correction. Uh, my regulator, the CBN, they do not coerce us. I think they encourage us. Encourage, you know, okay. To, yes. <laughs> you know, at least it's all part of uh, making sure that we are all within line. And in fairness, yes, some things like the CRR, the LDR, we may look at it as punitive. We know what the mindset is. But for us in banks, I think the main reason why lending has been maybe not as uh, free-flowing as it should be are two main things. First of all, you want to be sure that as much as possible, let's say 80-90%, your funds will come back. So you want to kind of de-risk what you do and you want it to have the possibility that even if something goes wrong, at least you can get back your capital. The other thing too is the source of fund. A lot of the things that we do in the infrastructure, the oil and gas, the power, you need long-term funding at cheaper prices. So you might need a funding for five, seven years. Yes, we can say you can use your core fund, but sometimes you need to be sure that at least for those long tenors, the pricing is also correct. You know, so one of the things that for us as a bank, would want the government to assist more. For example, maybe we've been talking about a tribunal for banks or a special kind of a judicial act that will say, look, instead of cases being in court for 15 years, 20 years, by then your, your money is worthless. Let there be some kind of a fast tracking. And then, of course, the CBN has started in terms of having the credit bureau but beyond that, I think individuals, companies need to start having proper credit scores, just like you have in the US and the UK, so that at least it also helps because people are building up their capacity for you to be able to say, look, I don't need to ask you for everything. If you have a good credit score, I'm likely going to be able to do more with you. So I think what we need is more of things that would help us to be able to de-risk, whereby you know that whatever happens, you can trace whoever you give the funds to. You can get your money back at the right time. And uh, you also need deep pockets. You know, when I look at uh, maybe the um, Nigerian Sovereign Wealth Fund, yes, they take most of their funds practically. They keep it with the foreign banks. But we, the Nigerian banks, we are the same people that have to now take these funds at exorbitant rates from all these same banks that the funds are being kept at. You know, so there has to be a way to look at it. That look, how do we use this to stimulate our own economy so that we can at least be able to help people that need to do a lot of uh, infrastructure, even in the power. There's a lot of uh, funding that is going on, but at the same time, you find that banks will still have to guarantee it. And when you look at the fundamentals, some of them, I don't want to go into what has happened in terms of the discos that banks financed and all those things. I mean, it hasn't been such a good story. So for it to be able to be done, there needs to be more de-risking. And we as banks are actually hoping that we can contribute our own part to, be I mean, to ensure that at least all those kind of um, de-risking helps faster. And Central Bank has helped with some of the funds. There are various intervention funds. We have the Power Fund. We have Bank of Industry. We have uh, NCDMB. That's the Nigerian Content uh, Development Bond as well, who also give low-cost financing to indigenous players in the oil and gas. So we need more of those things, but most importantly, for banks to be able to jump in, there has to be that environment that you are sure that at least you'll get your funds back. And also for the client to be able to pay back as much as possible, it has to be at a lower rate. So I think all those um, things like maybe as at now, we've, you know, there's been regulatory forbearance by the central bank, which is good. And they've also actually assisted banks to be able to say, look, will allow you to restructure. We're not going to put some things into NPLs immediately. You know, so that at least calms the waters. And those are the kind of regulations that at least helps the industry and it helps banks to do more where you know that your regulator is also 
assisting you at the back and at the same time the customer that you are giving money to is being sincere and has the capacity to return the funds to you because you don't want to kind of throw out your capital and at the end of the day there's another level of distress in the sector so whilst we want to lend it has to be done in a way that is well crafted and measured so at least that's in a nutshell thank you all right thank you so much basharat um i, I like the way you basically captured uh, your points. Uh, the CBN has actually, uh, you know, been encouraging bank. Uh, and and one thing that you mentioned now that I, I I think that is pretty important for a lot of people is is actually um, um, the the tribunal you did mention and and having um, some kind of uh, mobile courts or expeditious judiciary set up for banks so that we can basically uh, address issues of bad loans or uh, liquidation. I think it's pretty important and I, hope, and I hope there's someone listening here so that they can take note of this. This is very, very important for uh, de-risking uh, the banking sector, especially when it comes to credit. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. I'm going to go straight to Andrew now. We're, we're fast running out of time. Uh, it's going to be difficult for us to do round four of the questions, but I'm going to go straight to Andrew. Andrew, uh, you've heard everybody uh, so far. I deliberately wanted you to come in at this moment because you've heard everyone talk. Uh, you know, you, you see things from a more holistic point of view, you know, being, being an economist, uh, you know, that you are. Uh, but despite everything that we've heard, Nigerians are wallowing in despair and poverty, poverty is rife. Uh, of course, due to COVID-19, we've also, we've actually been in poverty for some years now, but COVID-19 has basically, basically exacerbated everything. Uh, but then if you go to, you know, richer countries like the U.S., you've seen a lot of helicopter money happening there. Uh, you've seen different kind of stimulus in other countries. You also said that our uh, stimulus is so far just 2% of GDP. What should Nigeria be doing, the Nigerian government be doing in terms of alleviating the poor? Should we see more of trader money? Should we see more? Should there be some kind of helicopter money for everybody? Can we actually afford this? Should they be printing more Naira? How can the government alleviate a lot of the poverty that we're seeing now? And let's remember, they've taken out stimulus. So <laughs> people are saying, look, where is the uh, uh, human face, like they say? What should the government be doing? What do you think, Andrew? Well, you know, I think it's a very good and not, not easy, easy question. I guess, um, I mean, I think to, to some extent, our view, similar to most people in the private sector, is that the, some of the programs that are purported to um, help the bottom of the pyramid, in fact, do the opposite. So, I mean, the most obvious one is the FOIL subsidy, right? Where FOIL is then diverted to other countries. And of course, wealthy people use much more FOIL per capita. So you have kind of an inefficiency. We actually, i sorry, I, th I don't think PBWC put out, but I certainly said a few years ago, if we really cared about the bottom of the pyramid, we would create some kind of uh, electronic money transfer of the some of the oil proceeds directly to, to everyone in Nigeria uh, so that they could benefit from it. And then if the government wanted tax revenue, they would then have to tax the people, not take the oil revenue, and you'd create more of a social contract. Of course, my suggestion didn't go very far in the current situation. So, I mean, I think, um, I think we, we've been advocating really two things. I mean, first, as, as bad as GDP is as a metric, we do need GDP uh, growth. And we've all discussed the fact for more investment in people. There is some kind of uh, lifting of, of all boats if we grow. There's no, so if, if we don't grow in a GDP sense, as I said, I don't like GDP as a metric. I much prefer the sustainable development goals. But at the stage we're at, we do, it's a, let's call it a necessary but not sufficient condition that we need GDP growth. But in terms specifically of the bottom of the pyramid, we've also advocated that the, the way expenditures are made should be um, reallocated from some of, some of the spending to um, uh, health and education in particular. Um, and, and education also not necessarily being tertiary education, and education being primary and secondary and also vocational. I mean, so we have a situation, I think the government um, came out, the spokesman the other day and said they're very upset that $3 billion are spent on government-owned enterprises that should, in fact, be sending money to the government, but instead are draining money from, from the government. Um, imagine, I mean, if the government, if we stopped sending that $3 billion uh, to that, and that money went directly to health and education. I mean, obviously, things like Agio Kutha Steel, 
the refineries that are draining resources. So, uh, you know, our, our, our biggest suggestion is focus on health and education, which are largely state level driven, but I mean, some of the financing from the, from the federal government, um, and that's what's going to make the biggest difference to, to, the, to the bottom of the pyramid. But I don't think we'd have any problem with an unconditional cash transfer of some of the oil revenue to, to the, the bottom of the pyramid. And of course, it would also create conditions for much better use of mobile money, electronic money, increase that penetration, and of course has to work on a non-smartphone for that. Um, so those would be the two, the two twin policies. One is we need to grow the economy faster. There's no choice. If we don't do that, we'll continue to have really struggle at the bottom of the pyramid. And two, in terms of the, um, of the uh, where we focus the resources, the federal, the public resources we have, and we should be focused on health and education where the government has to play a role. But in areas where you know, we can get private sector funding, the government should simply stop funding. It doesn't make any sense to, to us that the government would fund uh, port infrastructure, airport infrastructure, um, economic zones, all of those things you need to prove that you can attract private sector capital. So put the public sector capital into health and education of uh, Nigerian young people. All right, thank you so much, um, uh, Andrew, for, for those uh, brilliant comments. Um, I think uh, Andrew has basically said it here that uh, he's not, he's not uh, against uh, you know, creating uh, or allowing conditional uh, you know, electronic transfers to uh, the poor and deprived people in Nigeria, especially if it's coming from oil money. And I think that is something the government is doing, but I think they probably need to do more and then, uh, you know, focus less on spending on moribund projects that are actually not even uh, providing any form of relief to Nigerians. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity. And of course, we do need, uh, you know, fast uh, GDP growth rate. So thank you so much, everyone. I, I think we're going to move straight to um, um, uh, the next segment. We are running out of time. We'll move um, straight to uh, round five of of questions we're going to skip round four uh but i i want to believe that the 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 panelists have been responding to some of your brilliant questions i've seen some flashing through as well there's also a great conversation going on at the chat as well i see a lot of people bantering amazing comments there please keep it coming uh um, we're going to go straight to to you bashirat i'm coming back to you right now um i mean so this is basically parting shots and i think that uh for all those who have listened to as you know, some of the great comments that have been said here so far, uh, they also want to take something away. Uh, and and for, for me, my question to you is, uh, you know, the, the, last, the last recession led to a lot of losses, particularly for oil and gas firms, uh, and, and also those who feed off uh, oil and gas companies. Uh, what would you suggest uh, that, you know, oil and gas companies do differently this time around to avoid the crushing blow of the recession, uh, you know, particularly, you know, avoiding any, any form of insolvency or illiquidity. What do you think they should be doing now? I mean, we learned lessons from 2016 and 2017. Uh, yeah. So, but coming from your expert view, what should they be doing? Okay, I think um, looking at the oil and gas uh, players in particular, the first thing I would say is they should be transparent with their providers of finance. It helps, you know, and also be open, you know, lay your cards on the table. Sometimes you find out, especially Nigerians, they always feel, I don't want you to know how bad it is. And by so doing, they keep a lot of things back, which comes to bite them wherever, um, very hard later, you know. So that is one of the things they need to do to be able to allow their providers of finance to assist them at the right time. Although, of course, I mean, for banks, it's, they're also on the lookout for that, but you know, it's a two-way street. Because if you are given an impression that it's not correct, it will not help you, you know. And then the other major thing they have to do is cutting cost. Already even the DPR has mandated cost of services, what is being paid should be cut by 40%, which is a huge sum. So even if you had a contract that you thought I was going to make X, Y, Z, now you're making X, Y, Z minus 40%. And this is something you've taken financing for already. So whatever you need to do would be to say at least try not to make a loss. You might not make any income, but you need to be very brutal, I should say, and aggressive in the way the costs are, are being cut. And I think also in terms of restructuring, it's important you kind of dig deep to be able to say, okay, what can I also present? Even if you have to elongate the tenor of your facility from five years to 10 years, so be it, but be committed with it. 
And at least if your bank sees you are sincere, the likelihood of working with you to a successful outcome is very high. So, I mean, that is one of the things I encourage people in the field to do now. And um, when I talk about also diversification, if you can, no matter how it might be, you need to think beyond, you know, this is the time for you to think beyond the normal. I know some people in the industry, they're already thinking of saying, oh, property business is going to start contributing 60% of our income. I mean, that is one thing COVID has taught all of us. Mono streams of income can be very dangerous. So as much as it might seem like, oh, why are you in oil and gas and doing agriculture? Why are you in oil and gas and doing uh, property? But you need to think about it and find a way to be able to run it properly so far as you have the strength to be able to play in those sectors. So this is the time for people to really put on the um, thinking back uh, caps as much as possible. And I also think this is the time for you to, you know, pitch for more investments. Don't say, I want it all. You know, a lot of us in Nigeria always want to have 100% of our business. We don't trust other people. And we just sometimes don't know how to package a good pitch. You might have a very good business, but it depends on how you present it to the public. You know, so this is the time to look for investors like-minded that have, I mean, maybe not deeper pockets than you, but they can support your business at this time. Share it, you know, 100% of zero is zero. So this is not the time to grab everything to your chest and say, no, whatever happens, I'm going to be the CEO chairman and everything of this company forever and ever and nobody should come in. So this is the time you need to do more of that. And I think you need to be ready to aggressively push your boundaries. I mean, just think of what else can I do at this time to see it forward. It's not necessarily just um, wallowing in self party and saying this is the end. This is the time to be out there, reaching out to all your stakeholders so that at least you'll be able to weather the storm and come out at the other end. And I think if people just do those few uh, simple steps, it will help in terms of being uh, coming out, uh, we may not smelling of roses, but at least being alive <laughs> and being able to continue at the end of the pandemic and uh, this present recession. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Bashirat. Uh, Rolake, over to you. Uh, what's your parting shot for, for a lot of the guys listening to you now and others who will probably be watching this, uh, this, this, this uh, brilliant webinar after this uh, online or whatever? What's your parting shot to them? Well, I mean, I think I, I always like to liken um, an individual or professional to the country itself. You know, when we look at what Nigeria is doing, it's, it's a time of great economic challenge. It means that you have to tighten your belt. You need to be more staying your spending habits. You need to invest in a much more diversified way. Um, you need to be more self-sufficient. That's the reality. Mm. As, it's pretty much like Nigeria does. So where you need to trim, trim the excesses. Um, the spending you should be doing now as a professional entrepreneur needs to be really qualitative. It needs to be substantial. If you're going to be considering investing in real estate, you have to consider the sustainability of that investment. Is it something that I can realize returns on? Where is it located? Is there real accretive value over the long term? Um, looking at new hubs of uh, communities, perhaps towards the Dangote refinery side. And I'm not just trying to plug there for Mixta. I'm just saying that whatever investment strategy that you're undertaking really needs to be futuristic um, and invest in a way that's sustainable, that meets your needs today without jeopardizing your future. Um, and then finally, just looking at infrastructure as a whole, I'm a big advocate of really creating different types and segments of infrastructure that meet that meets different needs across our economy. And I really looking, look forward to having more public sector uh, and private sector partnerships to, to realize this great need for, for Nigeria. Thanks for having me. That's it, really. Thank you so much. No, don't, don't go yet. We still have one more for you later. Uh, there's, <laughs> okay. one, there's, one, there's one teaser for everyone later. Uh, I'm going to go next to Fola. Fola, um, I mean, uh, we rely on people like you to fund this country, all right? So uh, what are you going to say to Nigerians listening to you right now or watching you? You're on mute, Fala. You. All right, uh, great. Yes, sorry. No, apologies. I was, I was on mute. Um, I think I'll leave a couple of messages. The, the first one is that we're open for business in Nigeria as AFC. Um, part of the reason AFC was set up 
is so that regardless of the economic situation, regardless of the economic cycle, uh, we will be available and we will be open for long-term infrastructure financing in Nigeria. Uh, and we're working on many projects. Keep, uh, we keep on developing many projects um, that will ultimately uh, come to fruition and that will ultimately be built uh, in the best interest of, of Nigeria. Um, I think for Nigerians generally, for policymakers, for everyone who, who's paying attention to um, the economy and to economic development issues, I think a pattern message I will leave is one is, is something that I, I like to say, and I, I want to say it as often in public as possible. Uh, inflation is really the biggest obstacle to uh, capital formation and poverty eradication in Nigeria. Uh, it's probably also one of the biggest obstacles to economic development in Nigeria, inflation. Uh, and it needs to be tamed by every means necessary, you know, monetary, fiscal, and, and every other tool that we can employ to deal uh, with, with inflation. Because if you think about the foreign exchange problem, if you think about our poverty problem, uh, if you think about, you know, any number of, of the, the problems that are front and center of policymakers today, at the core of those problems uh, is, is inflation. And I do think that Nigerians need to understand that this is uh, one of our most important economic problems. And we need to think about and talk about and advocate for solutions uh, to the problem of inflation in the business community and uh, civil society, uh, individuals who are, who are simply interested in the subject. In the investment community, we all have to lend our voices to this issue of how do we tackle and comprehensively deal with inflation uh, in this country. In every country where we work as AFC in Africa, where inflation uh, is, is under control, and where um, there's strong interest, uh, th there's always strong interest uh, to invest and investment always uh, follows. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much, Fala. Uh, my, my very good friend, and you know, uh, and, and and a very brilliant economist, Wale Okunrobe, we've always argued about what we should be looking at. Should we be looking at, you know, core inflation or should we be looking at the general CPI? Uh, I mean, maybe that's a discussion for another day. I'm going to go over to Guy next. Um, Guy, uh, I mean, your, uh, your view is very, very needed now. I mean, you've been the optimist here. Uh, and then I think you've, been, <laughs> you've also been pragmatic, just like I am. Uh, in terms of pragmatism and optimism, what do you think Nigerians should be looking out for? Well, as I say, I think, I think the private sector has a great way of responding to these crises. We, we, we've seen amongst our client uh, companies and our client investors, people really, you know, reacting very fast um, and getting uh, solutions in place to the crisis that we are in. Now, that's not to say they've solved it, but they do move and adapt fast. So I think, um, you know, press on with deregulation uh, would be my message. I know that uh, it, it entails risks, but I think the, the, uh, the, the bigger risk is not to do that. That would be my message. All right, thank you so much, Guy. Press on with deregulation, it's risky, but the bigger risk is not to deregulate. Uh, we're gonna move over to Andrew. Andrew, is there hope? What a common man. Is, there, is there hope? Uh, no, I mean, there's tremendous hope. I, let me start by you know, my closing comments just saying, in a way, um, I would aspire, you know, I'd love to be the president of Nigeria because I think Nigeria is actually the easiest country in the world to manage. And the wow. reason it's the easiest or to lead, and the, easiest, the reason it's the easiest to lead is the Nigerian, I mean, you know, I've been all over the world, lived all over the world. Nigeria is the self organizing nation. When you look around at things that happen successfully in the country, groups of people who are not told by anyone what to do get together and accomplish things. And of course, many of our private sector actors, organized private sector actors that are um, doing very well, you know, they organize their own power, their own infrastructure, their own training, all of those own things. Because they have to build every part of this, the, the system to make it work. But this happens at every level of society. You know, you have the Evo apprenticeship system, you have people that organize the markets, you have uh, churches, mosques. I mean, one of the things, maybe Nigerians don't realize this, the extraordinary ability of these uh, self-regulating organizations. So things like ICANN, the NBA, which has been a little bit controversial on that, uh, the C CIBN. I mean, when I look at how th these organizations, other countries are very, you know, quiet, nondescript. In Nigeria, people get together and they organize them in this powerful way. So this is the self-organizing nation. And it would be the easiest place to just, if you let that self-organizing power 
uh, unleash it uh, a little bit. It's just going to take over and create uh, amazing things. I mean, there was an article in the Guardian yesterday about about uh, uh, the the ballet school in uh, I think it's in Osh Oshodi in 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 Lagos. Guardian in, uh, sorry, in, in the UK Guardian. And it was just an extraordinary story of someone who got together, built a ballet school. No one asked her to do it. She just did it. And now these people are getting scholarships to go to yeah. New York Ballet School, et cetera. So, you just, so you, we have this incredible nation on that. And all we need to do is unleash a little bit. And, and you unleash it and things will happen in Anugu, things will happen in uh, Cross River, things will happen in Sokoto. I mean, you had the, the gov and governors are stepping up. They're realizing this too. So in a, in a way, I think being the president of Nigeria should be the easiest job in the world. You just let Nigerians use the self-organizing power to get on with it. It is, Nigeria is the self-organizing nation. So let me stop there. God bless Nigeria. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, positivity is off the chains there. And I like what you said, Nigeria is a self-organizing country. I mean, when you said that, I just remember my estate, I remember all the associations I belong to. And these are all self-organized associations and people actually achieve a lot from there. My God, we've basically come to the end of this session, but I'm not going to go without doing something that we typically do in our outlooks. We call it buy, sell, or hold. So I'm going to just ask one question and your answer is either a buy or a sell or a hold. So a buy basically is you're in support of it. A seller is you're not in support of it, and a hold is you're neutral, right? So it's just straight questions. Uh, and I'm going to focus on some things that uh, someone sent to me earlier and said, look, maybe these are the things that Nigeria is supposed to do to raise money in terms of privatization. So um, first one is to Bashir. Uh, so buy, sell, or hold. Sell NNPs, NLNG. Should the government uh -huh. sell its equity in NLNG? Buy, sell, or hold? Um, hold. Hold. All right. Bashira says hold. Uh, so I'm going to come to you next, Rolake. Uh, so our railways, railway lines and the railway infrastructure across the country, uh, buy, sell or hold? Should Nigeria privatize railways? Ooh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it depends, but that's not a valid answer. No, it's I not. Would, I would say... Uh, Gosh, infrastructure. Hold, hold. Hold. All right. Yes. So hold for roller care. Uh, I'm gonna move straight to Fola. So Fola, uh, I'm gonna put you on the on the ropes here. So airports. Nigerians own. Nigeria owns. Government owns all the airports, and I don't think there's any private sector owned airports in Nigeria. So should Nigeria be holding? Should Nigeria sell its airports? Buy, sell, or hold? Easy, uh, easy answer, sell, uh, okay. but just in addition, the, you know, the, the two previous questions you asked also, sell. It's a question of how to sell, but sell. Wait, 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 let's be, let's be sure. So remember what I said, buy means you support the action. Sell means you don't support the action. And then hold means you're neutral. So should we sell airports? When you say buy, it means yes, we should sell airports. Is that what you're saying? Or sell, we should yes, not sell. Yes, absolutely. Them. Okay. No, no. Buy. In which case, the two previous questions as well. Buy. Buy. All right. Answer. Great. Buy. Question. Buy. So that's the answer. So uh, Paula is weighing in. A lot of, a lot of uh, you know, our participants are also weighing in. I can see a lot of buy and sells going on right there in the chat room. I'm going to come next to you, um, Andrew. Um, so um, this one now is NMPC. I mean, everybody has talked about NMPC a lot. And, uh, government also said they're looking at uh, maybe on bundling and NPC, but they haven't still been able to do that. So uh, government selling or government flipping its equity in NNPC, what do you suggest? Buy, sell, or hold? Partial buy. Partial private. Partial buy. All right, all right. So partial buy, I like that. Uh, Andrew goes for partial buy. That's partial privatization of the NNPC. Finally, I'm going to come to Guy. Guy, um, now, I'm looking at someone said that, look, why does government own all the highways, like all the major highways in Nigeria? Isn't it about time we privatize those highways? So the question is, do we privatize our highways? Buy, sell, or hold? You're mute, guy, or mute. Buy. Buy, all right, guys. So you headed for but our- I'm going to have a of what happens afterwards, but buy, yeah. 
Bye. All right. <laughs> All right, guys. So you heard from our brilliant uh, panelists today. I want to thank you guys uh, for doing this session with us. Uh, guys, just to, you know, to recap, uh, Cell and LNG, Bashira says hold. Uh, Cell Railways, Bashir uh, Rolake says hold. Uh, do we privatize airports? Fala says buy. Uh, he also says buy railways, buy uh, NNNG. And then equities, uh, you know, on um, Bondon NPC, Andrew says partial buy. And then privatize major railways, guy says buy. And that is it for me, Wade. I'm going to hand over to you so that you can give the brilliant panelists all the kudos they deserve. They've been here, they've stuck it all two hours. Uh, Andrew, I know, had to wake up 5 a.m. wherever he is just to be on this on this webinar. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone who has, you know, tuned in and who's, you know, dropped all the brilliant chats that we've seen over almost 600 chats uh, and several questions. There's also going to be uh, a summary of everything that has been discussed here on our metrics website. We're also going to put some on other, uh, you know, partner websites as well so that everyone can read and learn from this awesome, awesome deliberation. Over to you, Wadi. Ugo, thank you once, once again. You've, you've done brilliantly. But let, first and foremost, let me thank all our panelists, um, Basirat, Bashirat, Lolake, Fola, Guy, and Andrew. I, I, I've learned so much. Um, just before I, I, I do a quick roundup, I, I, I'd like to say something about um, what Ugo said earlier about Jakonde and the Jakonde estates that came up in Lagos. And Rolake, Ro, Rolake has continued to emphasize on that. It's, it, it, it was actually a private um, uh, public sector um partnership and it opened up a lot of roads today the roads that lead to lekki that leads to Ekpe, that leads to paja that leads to even the roads that lead to Iponri, all happened because of these things that that came in in the real estate sector and it was really for members in the public sector and it was it was a loan loan um, facility that was gotten through a bank and and most of them paid off those loans and had um, what's it called. So for low cost housing is really important. And like Rolaka said, those partnerships really need to come in. Government needs to put down the, the enabling environment through providing the incentives through lands as their shareholding and, and moving on. Um, so from the beginning, Andrew said this was a moment of truth. And really the moment of truth for Nigeria is where are we heading? Um, all, our, well, all, all our panelists agreed that we'll be looking at a U-shaped um, recovery system. Um, Guy specifically said that we should be looking at coming out of, of the um, doldrums that we're in currently at the end of quarter one, maybe quarter two. Um, Bashirat was saying that if we have a second wave of the virus, uh, of the pandemic, then we might, we might be seeing um, maybe a W and L shaped um, um, recovery. Aside from that, and if we do find a, if we do find a vaccine for the virus, we might might be going in the direction of V-shape. Um, Fola, Fola mentioned the, the need to increase the investment to GDP rate from about 14% to at least a minimum of 25 to 30% for Nigeria, which can unlock about $60 billion in investment opportunity. Um, I think it was Guy or Andrew who said, who said simplicity to managing the economy and reducing um, regulations and agencies will help unlock a lot of the debt capital that we have within within the, the system. Rolake mentioned incentives to unlock debt capital through partnerships with government. And one of the things we said, I, I spoke about just when I started about the, the partnerships between the government of Jack Conde between 1979 and 1981 with, with um, financial institutions in, in Lagos. Um, um, boosting capital investment with about 10% return in local funds. And that was, um, guy talking about um, foreign investments coming in. Um, most foreign in investments are, are mostly portfolio investments, meaning that they come in and they go out in dollars rather than putting them into foreign, um, foreign, um, foreign capital, thereby encouraging um, the local currency to grow. And by boosting the local currency by about 10% of your returns, will actually be able to help you manage any FX devaluations as time goes on. Um, the pension fund has come up again today. It came up at the last session. What are we doing with such huge amounts rather than just putting them into the portfolio market like Guy said earlier on? Real estate is key. And um, the need to attract more private sector to, this, to, to um, areas like, um, like um, transportation um, and so on, while government can focus on on areas of health, education, and things that are really, really um, pertinent towards ensuring that the, the grassroots do, do go out of the level of poverty. 
Um, once again, I want to thank everyone who listened, everyone who watched. Um, the, pro the recording will be available on the Naira Metric YouTube channel. Um, you can listen to that and you can get more insights from, from all our panelists. For those whose questions were not answered by listening to, to, to the session once again, I'm sure you'll get new insights and better understanding into what our panelists have shared with us. I want to thank the panelists once, once again. And then Ugo, I'll return back to you so that you can, you can close for the day. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a very great rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ugo, you're on mute. Right, you still there? Ugo. All right, all right. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. I uh, appreciate all the time. Rodake, thank you so much. Uh, Guy, thank you so much. Uh, Madam Bashira, I appreciate, appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, appreciate it as well. Thank you, everybody. Okay, guy, thank you. And for everyone on the back end in our metrics crew, you guys did an amazing job. Thank you all so much. Uh, and then until we do this again sometime in December, uh, stay safe, everybody. And remember, remember uh, to always hope for Nigeria. Nigeria will always be better. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>